So at some point between me clicking that button. Hey, we're live now, I see. Yeah, but still saying preparing. A, yeah, we're, I'm sure we are. And this is the it, fun part at the beginning of the show. Yeah, remember there's like a 10 second delay. Um, um, sure. So uh, while I let everybody know on the other channel that things got a little messed up, I uh, want to introduce Daryl to everybody. Yeah, everybody, this is Daryl. Hi. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> yeah. You want you want me you want me to talk about myself or something? Else? Um, we will absolutely want you to talk right. about yourself uh, as right. soon as all the the fun stuff starts uh, sharing everywhere. Um, first of all, thank you for taking time to to join us in this uh, beginning of the chaos. Um, I'm happy to be here. This is the good stuff. Cool I mean, the real good stuff would be if we were meeting in person, playing a game together. But second to that, let's talk about games and have fun. Yeah, it's good to see you. Uh, hopefully, we'll be seeing each other soon if things keep going in the right direction, right? Oh, that would be so good. Mm. Yeah, seriously. Hoping, hoping. Um, yeah, so welcome to the full 42. Um, typically, we do some guesses on each other, but Chris has something else planned, Ooh. which I have no idea what it is. We haven't talked about it. It's going to be uh, something new. Um, and then I think on today's show, uh, if we have time, uh, which what is time anyway, but a construct, um, we're going to talk to Daryl about uh, the design process. Um, hopefully, I'd love to. I always love talking to you about the fail faster method. Um, maybe the state of conventions, how they're going to look in, in the few short months ahead. Sure. Um, Clubhouse, this new thing that we've been we kind of mm -hmm. uh, adventuring in um, and how that's going to impact the game industry. And then uh, maybe some solo uh, game talk and uh, Dark Knight stuff that's going on. So it's a full show. Um, and I'm very much, I've been looking forward to it for a while. So Sweet. You, you actually make it sound like we're way more prepared. Yeah, that sounds super organized. On the back end, we're prepared. We have show notes. We have a Google sheet with like things we want to talk about. And then as soon as Chris and I start like talking, it just it's off the rails immediately. So oh, yeah, you should yeah. start on the rails if you want to get off the rails. You have to start on if you want to get off the rails. Yeah, sure. Probably just should have just called the show off the rails. Off, off the rails. rails. Well, Maybe that's um, the future subtitle. I love it. <laughs> like episode 6.5 will be off the rails. So why don't we start with the, uh, uh, actually, maybe we should delay to see if we can get some people in the chat, because I'd like to see if other people guess, but mm -hmm. uh, you know what, uh, they can they can guess as we, they watch. We can, give them, we can give them a minute or two. We, yeah. we can talk about random things. That's like true. our special, special guest. Yeah, I, I, I brought up, because I don't know if he'll come near me after this, but Lincoln is the real celeb. Um He's actually featured in the Titanic board game. If you oh, look, no kidding. If you look close, there was a real dog kennel in the Titanic. So we renamed the tile Lincoln's dog kennel in the board game. So There's he snuck a little in, nugget. Yeah, he snuck his way in there. I think he snuck in a couple other games so far. We're working on getting him in the game. So Very nice. He, oh, he's in this really like lick everything mode. It's too much. Oh, man. Stop. It, this is the problem. He listens really well. And we used to say, no bite, just kisses, just to stop him from biting people. Mm. And, and now he's taken that too literally. So he just kisses everything. <laughs> Better than biting Better everything. Biting, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like he's just annoying, not going to jail. Aw. So cute. All right. So you stalled. You did your job, Lincoln. You Perfect. Can go, you can go chew your bone now. Almost right. like it was. I planned. think I've successfully directed everyone where they're supposed to be, and it'll it'll take a minute for people to catch up. But um, okay. oh, that's not true. I didn't touch Discord at all. Oh well. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. I'll do that part. Okay. Awesome. Um, all right. So I put together a quick little um, game. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you guys, uh, well, I'm going to give you guys clues. Um, you're going to get three clues. You get two guesses each. Whoever guesses uh, correctly first gets a point. Ooh, first. So this is a speed element. Yeah. So if uh, both of you use up your two guesses, then I get two points. Ooh. That way I get to play. Well, wait, I'm wait, wait. Two so if we don't guess, do you only get? Like what we guess wrong, or you're getting two no matter what. If you 
Uh, well, you guys all have to guess something. Oh, right? we'll have to. Okay. Okay. I'm just um, I'm just trying to lawyer the rules here. <laughs> so uh, uh, what you're guessing is a board game. And what I've done is I've grabbed uh, a rating of one comments from board games. Mm. And you're going to try to guess what board game it is. Awesome. Ooh. Are we a team? Are Daryl and I a team? Oh, no, no, no. no. no I'm definitely, I want to beat you. I want to sure. beat you. This All is right. not, a, this is not a co-op. I hate uh, co-ops. We'll get, we'll get into that later. All right. All right. So did you say you hate co-ops? I do. Oh, I agree. Okay. Uh, we'll get into it. We'll, we'll, we'll team up. We'll cooperate against Mike. Yeah. Uh, as long as it's semi-cooperative, I'm in. Semi -cooperative. I'm in. Um, It'll be a one versus all. All right, yeah. so uh, I'm just going to say clue one, and I'll t I'll repeat what it is, um, and then you guys can jump in wherever you want. Remember, you get two guesses. Is there no theme tying these game in? Like it's just one rating comment. They're just games, and you guys will know the games. I didn't okay. I didn't go okay. crazy and pick something. Okay. Else. Okay. All right. All right. So first clue. Glad I got to try it before I bought it. I can get my family to play Catan and Splendor. This would have turned them off from gaming. There's no game here. Oh, no. I mean, <laughs> yeah, these I are all going to not be good. Yeah, I mean, they're one ratings. They're I feel all like, one ratings. Yeah. I feel like they're all ratings of my games, but... Uh, all right. Uh, well, I can continue to clue, too. Please, please. All right. They do get a little more detailed as they go down. Or, or do you need us to guess before we hear? No, no, no. Okay. You get two guesses. You can jump in anytime you want. Okay. Clue two. Was not enthralled by this game. Too simple. It's also essentially a roll and move because if you can't find your color, you're screwed. I mean, can't I'll guess Sagrada. Nope. No. I thought the color. I thought maybe. You can't find your color, you're screwed. All right. Here comes clue three. And you guys, you're not uh, being timed after this. You can. Okay. You can talk. All right. Clue three. Such a bore. There are so many turns that just involve drawing two cards and nothing else. Take it a ride. Yep. You got it. Wow. <laughs> wow. I told you they get more detailed as you. Dang. <laughs> what was the can't find your color? Well, trains. I think yeah, the drawing, train trying color. to get like, oh, I need a blue. But, uh, you know, okay. like I get six cards. Right. I mean, I've had moments like that, but Take the Ride's a great game. Yeah, I gotta yeah. say, I'm I'm probably going to disagree with every single one of these. I just yeah. thought some of these were fun. Yeah, especially uh -huh. there's so many Ticket to Rides now. Like people don't even understand. I think mm -hmm. it, I was just I was just unpacking some, and I think I have one through seven volumes one through seven. There might be more than that. Plus, I have sales to Steve, sales and Steam, Europe. Germany, like base mode. I actually was going to take a picture of how much Calix room is left and say that Alan can't design any more than that because it'll just mess up my configuration. So, do you have the junior one too? I'm not a junior fan. I'm also not a fan of London or New York. Oh, okay. I was going to ask you if you had those two. Only, only because I really think they're just two player games and I'm not a huge two player game either. We're gonna learn I've a lot about it. I've only played the Asian, uh, the one with the mountain pass. Yeah. This, um, the Europe one and the normal one. Interesting fact too: the Asian one is the has on one side the only map that is not designed by Alan Moon. It's designed by a gentleman named Francis Francois Valentine, who's a Canadian. Just lives like an hour away from me. The more you know. Yeah. Da, 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 da. It's gonna be chock full of information. Wow. Awesome. Because Maybe. you and I don't have any information, this is something interesting. It's no. new facts being brought in. <laughs> My mom and the four viewers we normally have are not ready for what Daryl's going to bring. Uh -oh. Learning stuff today. Welcome to class. All right, so here is number two. Uh, let me see how many of these I have, by the way. I'm curious. Okay, we have six of these. So okay. here's number two. All right, I almost said the answer. <laughs> uh, all right, the first one is this. Bland card moving for 1,000 plus hours. Ooh. 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 All right. Bland card moving for one plus. Clue yeah. two. 
run in wet concrete, leave treasure where you found it, and die from boredom and fiddle hell. Whoa. Fiddle hell cement. Treasure. Treasure is a good comment. It's got to mean something that's like piratey, I feel like. All right. Ready for the third clue? Yep. It's like reading an encyclopedia while being drilled in the eyeballs. Doesn't anyone... <laughs> <laughs> this is hard to finish doesn't anyone have a life a girlfriend a job not fun not enjoyable two hundred dollars wasted and i'm selling after only buying it two days ago i hate you all wow. <laughs> that one didn't have a lot of detail but it was but, wow that is a statement although 200, 200 yeah that's a, is, good, that's a good nugget i mean i wanted but that's an expensive game any expansions? Oh, I might have a guess. And I have two guesses. Yep, you, you get two guesses. Dominion? Nope. Oh. I was thinking like thousand cards. They said like so many cards, maybe all the expansions. Yeah. They said a thousand plus hours. Hours. Oh, that was it. Shoot. Oh, I got it. Gloomhaven. Correct. Oh, Isaac. Oh. Man, I got zero points right now. It's one, one, zero. All right. Don't down, Chris. <laughs> All right, next one. By the way, have you guys finished or played Gloomhaven at all? Or what's your experience with it? I've never played. Yeah. I watched Rolling Solo play through um, the initial campaign and I, I watched it as if it was a movie. I loved I love the updates. I love the the wow. chapter by chapter, but I, I set it up, I went through it and then watched him play it, and then I haven't opened the box. Yeah, I, I watched. Oh, good. I, oh, I was just gonna say I watched it. and I just knew it wasn't my jam. I play. I I first backed it. I was like one of. The, I was on the original Kickstarter Ooh, thing. Same. Um, so I have the box still. Um, and uh, before I learned it and everything, we had a local con, and someone was going to run the first game there. I was like, perfect, they can teach me. Yeah. Uh, I played sure. it, and I was like. Yeah, it's okay. And never yeah. open my box to mm -hmm. continue. And it really the real reason for me is that I play Pathfinder, which is the, uh, like totally. every other Sunday, and I play Star Wars RPG every other Sunday. That's yeah. way better than anything a board game can do RPG wise. Right. So it's not really a uh, uh, dismissal of gloom. No. Or it's just I have the better version of it already. So. Yeah, I just I just realized like I didn't have the group for it, and then the friends that I do know that would that were going through it, I kind of missed the beginning, and then I felt like oh, I don't want to kind of join in and be like the noob and feel like I don't have like the full the full experience. And then I realized, like you said, there's probably others that I would just rather be doing. Lincoln, you can stop licking me. I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. He's right. going to be in the spotlight too long without knowing he's there. Yeah, he'll just every so often surprise you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, all right, so here is game number three. All right. <clears throat> four. Four. Three. Three. Oh, that's three. Oh, okay. Yep. You got Someone one, played. I got one. Chris has zero. Right, 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 right. All right, clue one. Very pretty looking, but boring theme game with mediocre to poor tableau building and no real choices or options as it is dictated by random dice. The only interaction with other players is a resource and a card denial. Might as well be playing on my own, number one in my most overhyped games of all time. That one had a lot to it. Yeah, there's a lot of pieces and Mike thinks he's got it. I'm going to take a guess before Daryl does. Go ahead. I'm gonna say it's Machi Koro. Nope. Damn it. All right, I got a second clue. This is an all caps right here. Deeply mediocre. <laughs> Experience made worse by poor explanations, insufficient bits, some radically unbalanced cards, randomization at two critical steps of the game loop and a murder by numbers endgame. It splits the difference between gizmos and terraforming Mars, and in the process fails at both. 
these are some deep cuts. Yeah, that was like layered cuts. Yeah. Whew. Gizmo is in terraforming Mars. Like, talk about extreme different games. Yeah. What, what were is... the game references they put? They said uh, splits the difference between Gizmos and terraforming yeah. Mars. And there was oh. another one in there too, wasn't there? Another game they said. Uh, nope. Hmm. And splits the uh, and in the process fails at both. It says. I mean, man, Gizmos makes me want to like say something with marbles, like, like a uh, potion explosion or something. I'm not guessing that. I'm not guessing. That. I'm just speaking out mm-hmm. loud. Uh, but terraforming Mars, holy mackerel! Then that's gone real heavy. That's like light and heavy. What's the difference? Yeah. What was it at the mean? beginning again? What was the Sorry, first what one? Again? What was the first one again? It was. Uh, this is the first clip. Very pretty looking, but boring themed game with mediocre to poor tableau building and no real choices or options as it is dictated by random dice. The only interaction with other players is a resource and card denial. Might as well be playing on my own number one in my most overhyped games of all time. It feels like Alien Frontiers, but there's no way... Nah, yeah. I could go to uh, clue three. Yeah, we have to. I mean, we we have two guesses, right? Yeah. Well, you have two. I got one. I'm going to say Scythe? Nope. Hmm. Okay. All right, here's clue three. I don't enjoy playing solo games, and this is a solo game even when playing it with people. How this game has earned the Kinnerspiel de Yars is beyond me. Also, it's currently showing as the number one family game, which also is... Wingspan. Yes. <laughs> wow, good one. That one had all the clues in it for you. Wow. <laughs> wow. Dang. I've Brutal. never been a kid who would find this entertaining. Ooh. <laughs> yeah. That, it, those were, I will say, just uh, I, those were the three worst and... Uh, ones that i could pick that wouldn't give it away right away right right um obviously it's a highly rated game so. yeah <laughs> yeah it, it's doing all right in spite of yeah you know i, the I think they're fine despite these three reviews yeah i feel like elizabeth hargraves can live with that yeah <laughs> i'd be fine with those three if i had <laughs> like wingspan yeah. <laughs> wow those are brutal yeah i know i was like oh i don't know if i want to put that on there but um all right number four what do we got uh daryl's two two to one one I'm zero yeah i should but you have a but you have a big catch-up opportunity we but bu- we bust I know. this See, that's why i did the two yeah i like i like the scoring mechanic that's, that's some good design uh, i'll reserve judgment to see if i get any points at all here all right <laughs> uh uh game number four oh, let's see if we had any about oh Looks like Corey said wingspan. Ooh, I wonder nice. if he got it before you. You know, we got oh. like a 10 second delay here. Yeah, actually, Corey's feeding me, I'm going to say. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it doesn't give a time on, the, uh, on mine anyway when they say it, too. So I'll, right, I'll try to keep an eye on it. it. You guys should probably ignore it in case they do give you it. Yeah, I'm not looking. Yeah, I don't no. want to be influenced. I'll try to keep an eye on it. Um, all right. So, number four. Again, I almost said the answer. I really shouldn't put those in the title. Um, All right, clue number one. Tried it twice. Surprise how this game reached high rank, not worth it. Sorry, I got to pause you for a sec. I just had a great moment. I don't know. Uh, I was just opening a fruit by the foot, and there's two in the same package. Whoa. Wow. That was like a double double shreddy. Sorry. Anyways. (laughs) It doesn't happen recording. every day. And now that, you was have a, video that was a life. That was a life moment. I got it recorded. Anyway, yeah, it was it's, it. it's forever it's until true. Chris deletes it later. Chris will delete <laughs> it later. <laughs> no, I'll delete everything. But everything. Just this moment. Mm-hmm. <laughs> It'll be like Wandavision, where it's just erased. <laughs> You're like, no. what was that? It was ten seconds of them talking about a fruit roll. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> sorry to interrupt. I totally missed it because my mind was blown by seeing. Oh, no, that's fine. Time. Well, it's not that big of a clue, unfortunately, but. Here it goes. Clue one. Yeah, it's not a good one. Tried it twice. Quick. Surprise how this game reached high rank, not worth it. 
Yeah. So obviously not a lot there. Nope. Clue two. I love worker placement games, but I hate this one. In fact, it is the worst of its kind. An uninspired luck fest with unbalanced asymmetrical player powers and tons of expansions. There's a lot there. Yeah. We should have that. Worker placement with tons of expansions? Hmm. All right. Going to go to uh, clue three. The highest rank worker placement is Lord feel, of Liberty, but there's not to- tons of. I think I think we should have to make one of our guesses in the first two. Oh, that's interesting. If I do this again, maybe I'll make that. All right. So clue number three. Okay. Totally awful. Why would I play a game of Stone Age where the dice facings are essentially zero 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 one three twelve? Way too swingy. Impossible to properly mitigate risk or survive bad die rolls. Rather just play Stone Age. Averna? No. That's a pretty good guess, though. Wow. Tons of expansions. That's the part of this. Yeah. Looking at the chat, they're not getting it yet either. Tons of okay, I'm using my second guess right away Agricola. Nope. All right. All right. It's all you, Mike. Mike, you might it. you might be getting Chris back in the game. Ooh. Right. No pressure. Thanks for, thanks for the pressure. I, I appreciate that. <laughs> what were the dice layouts? One zero 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 one three twelve. Ah, that seemed really specific. <laughs> yep. Worker placement, tons of expansions. Somewhere. Yeah, the dice thing I just started to ignore because I was like, yeah. There's tons of dice. Oh man, worker placements with dice. That's not that's not that common. Hey, maybe that's your alien frontiers, but that's it's, no. Um, it's worker placement with dice, but the dice don't uh, they don't add no, up. No, but those numbers don't make yeah. sense to me. Hmm. That's a great game. I haven't played that in a long time. You know, it'd be it really has, it has a ton of expansions too, right? It's got the factions expansion, all the extra You know it'd be the funniest answer, but I, I know it's not. Stone Age. Oh, that'd be great. That'd be, <laughs> oh, be tricksy. Yeah, that'd be good. It's only got one expansion, though, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. With style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Worst title for an expansion. Very bad. They made one that was like in between a Greek, I mean, not a Greek, um, Stone Age and. They did a winter edition as well. Yeah, they did. They, they blended two of them together. Oh, Carcassonne, right? Carcassonne and Stone Age. Or oh, did they? Oh, maybe it wasn't Carcassonne. I can't remember now. Anyway, interesting. What's, what's your? Uh, did you do two? Did you do any? Oh, games? I did two, but I think I know it. I but haven't gotten. I'm confused any. by the number of expansions. I don't want to tell him now because I'm afraid I know what it is. Well, if, I, he, I, if he doesn't I, get it, I'll get my two points, but I'll let you. Yeah. No, actually, I'm starting to doubt myself. I haven't gotten anything. I would go with Alien Frontiers, but I got I got nothing else. That's a bad right. guess. You give up? All right. What what's your your third non pointy getting guess? Well, because of the swinginess, I was starting to think of Marco Polo. But, nope. No, I I've actually never played that. Oh, it is wonderful. Champions of Midgard. Ah! Wow! Wow! That's some hate. Huh. I actually have it right here. to adjust my. It's like right here to adjust my camera to make sure it wasn't sitting right. Interesting. All right. Nice. So it's two, two, and one. Yeah. I, I like, like that the, Mike's the only one without two. I like those Thanks. numbers. Thanks. I'll get there. Well, I hope you I hope you get this next one. It makes the last real interesting. That's true. All right. Um, oh yeah, that's true. If you guys don't get this one, then the last one doesn't matter. I'll have four points and either one of you will get there, right? But we'll get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Here's the fifth one. Okay. Clue one. For fun, I've never been waterboarded, but I imagine the experience is comparable. Mm. Oh, okay. God. Okay. That's just a deep cut. Doesn't really tell you anything. No, I but, funny. but I feel it. Oh, you know what? I've got four clues in here. That one didn't tell you anything. I just thought that was funny, so I added Yeah. We appreciate it. That was clue zero. Clue zero. Here's clue one. 
felt like I was doing taxes, trying to keep track of all the rules and plan out my moves. I'm sure with more frequent plays, it would start to click, but the first game was overwhelming. Okay. Doing taxes. Some, right, math, figure, some math in there. You, you got some math in there. I'm going to guess. Okay. Power grid. Nope. No. I can see where you go there, though. But, but you know what? You just triggered a new suggestion I have for you advancing this game. You should be, make it that you score points based on what round you guess it. Oh, I like but it. if you guess in the first, it's worth three, two, and one. Then maybe you get three or four if we don't get it. Yeah, your points go down as clues are revealed. My points go up. Yeah, I like That's that. Fun. Uh, this is what happens when designers get together. <laughs> You'd have to keep me honest with my placement of clues, though. That's fair. <laughs> All right. Uh, here's clue number two. Because Q pushing Euros should stop being promoted as fun, multiplayer solitaire is not something I enjoy doing. Hmm. I assume they're saying because, like, they gave it a one. Because right. cube pushing, yeah. Right. Cube pushing multiplayer solitaire. Hmm. It feels like doing taxes. Yeah. I mean, I do feel that playing some games. So, you guys ready for the third? Mm -hmm. Well, fourth, but uh, clue number three. All right. Yeah. The absolute worst part in this game is having to feed your workers. Talk oh. about a waste of time that just drags out an already tedious game. Agricola. Correct. Yeah. All right. So it's three, one, and two. So Chris Mike, can win. Mike, you gotta you gotta do it just for the pride. Well, maybe this last one's worth two. Yeah, I like that. Let's do it. Well, either one. Daryl, either Daryl gets it. Well, if I get it, I screw everything up. Daryl wins. No, if you get it, you win. If it's worth two. No, yeah. no, no. The way it is right now, right? No, no. Just play. It's worth two. It escalates at the end. Right, but Daryl, you have three. Mm -hmm. He has one. So if he oh. gets it, he'll tie with you. Which yeah, we'll share. With? We'll share yeah. victory. Fine with that. All right. All right. I don't have a tiebreaker, so. <laughs> All right. Um, I'll ask you again about the Fraggle Rock Dog and see if you get it. Sprocket. Uh, sprocket, yeah. Almost said sparkly. Um, all right. I said Sparky because that was the name sparky. of my dog. Sparky's um. All right. Um, remember, it's whoever says it first. You can interrupt me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got in there. Mike's a little too polite tonight. All right. Clue number one. I'm just going to mute you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hope you know sign language. I, don't. <clears throat> I know a little bit. Uh, okay, here it is. Clue number one. Wait. I was just seeing what the uh, the chat had. They were going to guess Power Grid as well. That was a good guess. Anytime yeah. you say math, Power Grid, anytime I play Power Grid, I kind of wish I had a pencil and paper to kind of keep track of stuff. So. Mm. Talking right. about that, if I get muted. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Don't mute our guests. No, can I just turn their video off too? Actually, it's funny. <laughs> Look at what it is. Oh, Ben and Emily's. Don't I have that here? I think I want to say I have that here. Oh. No, the owner, the owners of Floodgate is from their wedding. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's cool. All right. So uh, here's clue number one. How to play. Roll a D6. On a six, you win the game. Five or less, you lose. When that's over and done with it, spend the remaining time with a better game. <laughs> wow. Uh, yeah. All right. Here's clue number two. Assuming that didn't give you everything you need. Uh, I'm close, but no. There's a large setup time and upkeep. The game itself is a slow grind. A turn mostly consists of hoping that you roll uh, what you need on some dice. Then you end up waiting a long time. To have oh, I got it. Oh, no. What? 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 You didn't, did you? Say say your guess. Is it Arkham Horror? It's Arkham Horror. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> ouch. I had to. I had to. You didn't even let me finish. 
Wow. I'm going to mute you. I'm, I'm muting wow. you now. <laughs> That's wow. some good points here. <laughs> so the wow. guest next week is Kevin Wilson. No. <laughs> <laughs> Again, these views are not shared by the full. That's fair. Wow. All right. Well, that was pretty good. Three, three, and two. Oh. I'm not surprised. That game gets shit on quite often. There were actually a pretty good amount of fun things yeah. to grab for this one. Some material. No, that was good. That was fun. Yeah, yeah. I liked it. It was fun putting together, too. I mean, when you're reading rank one ratings of games that aren't yours, it's right. fun. Right, right, right. But I, don't actually, ever read them for years. <laughs> I, it can be fun. Uh, one time, I remember being on Meeple Syrup, and I, uh, I want to say it was, oh, uh, who was it? One of the guests prepared a bunch of our games as what our one-rated comments, but he sent them to us as a text, and we had to read them straight face. Oh wow, oh, that's fun. That's oh, just kind of like, like mean tweets, kind of. Yeah, thing. exactly. He was like mean tweets, that's but. Funny. But it looked like ratings. Corey guessed Elder Sign, which was really close. Ooh, nice I think, guess, dice, I think the dice were, uh, yeah. All right. Very yeah, cool. that was fun. I enjoyed that. Yeah, it was good. It worked out better than I thought it would. I thought that'd just yeah, be. That's a good segment. You'll have to do it again. All right. So um, hmm. go back to our notes here. Uh, yeah, you have what you, what you put in here to discuss next. Yeah, so for the setup, um, the I guess the three of them, they're kind of disjointed. Two, two of them are together, uh, the design process and the fail faster method. And then the idea of, of conventions, if things keep going in the uh, positive direction that they are. But um, it's funny, and this was not planned at all, but the design method, like you, you see the three of us trying to like game the game and coming up with, well, that doesn't work. What if you did this kind of stuff? Um, and I'm a big fan of the fail faster thing, which I know Daryl is um, as well. But um, I don't want to get too far ahead and talk about the design process with Batman. But um, where do ideas? Where well, do you get ideas from? Yeah, I mean, well, but before you even you kind of breeze past it, the fail faster method, like explain that a little bit more. Sure. Yeah. yeah go ahead. Well, I, I mean, I'll, I'll I'll set you up, and then you can. Uh... You can take it home, but uh, uh, I'm sure I don't know who came up with it. But for me, who I learned it from specifically, and then ended up making a resource called that is Jay Cormier, uh, and he developed it. I'm sure with with Sen uh, Fong Lim. The two of them have made a ton of great games together. They're really you know um, talented, and have a lot of cool stuff. And so Jay specifically actually made a journal called the Fail Faster Journal, where people can you know, track that down and, and track along your prototype and kind of uh, track some good notes and, and keep paying attention and asking good questions because the goal is, you know, almost to break your game or kill your darling or find, you know, the, 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 the weaknesses. And so you want to fail fast. Like the goal here is get it out of your head, get it on the table, get it in front of other people, and then find where the things that you thought because you always think everything's going to go smoothly. You always think it's like, oh, this is great. Mm -hmm. And then you you discover those blind spots that are always going to be there. So that, that's how I see kind of fail faster. And I adopted that with the game design class that um, Keith and I put together that you're somewhat familiar with. We wanted the kids to get their ideas on paper on the table quicker whether it's stick figures and index cards or whatever, before they started thinking and thinking and thinking, get it out of your head, get it on the table, see where it's broken. I know with Floodgate, with um, the play testers, like, welcome to Floodgate, please break our games. You, you want the game to be broken as fast as possible because you don't want to waste all that time with something you think is great. And then you realize that, oh, it's a pile of trash. Get the trash moving, like get it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, that's funny. I was talking about this earlier today before I saw, saw the uh, show notes or that part in there. And uh, it's I came up with a design in my head and I, like three hours later, I'm like already writing stuff on, you know, to get mm -hmm. it to the table. And then, of course, life happens and I had to do some work and stuff and I put it away. Haven't touched it for days now. And that's why I, I, if I had just gotten it to the table, 
I've been playing it, fixing it, and all that stuff. Yep. But now I'm worried. Like it's right there, looking at it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's it's looking at you. Yeah, I know it is. It mm-hmm. is like. Yeah, and there's these classic moments. It happens to me all the time now, but even early on when I wasn't even thinking I'd be a game designer, I remember meeting, especially first-time designers that would tell you all these ideas they had for their first game. And, you know, like I met one time this one person and and they came to show uh, us a game and they came with a binder and they were like, this is the spreadsheets and the math for the cards I'm going to someday make. Oof. And it was like, uh-oh. <laughs> like you're you're in the weeds like this is a problem and so that's why this is what happens when you don't fail fast and so it, it's really important to encourage people like as much as you might think it's embarrassing or it might not be ready that's the point it's okay like that that that's the process and it, and as much as we might even get better and skilled it just means the iteration between maybe gets faster but we still have to go from an alpha to a beta to a gamma like there's a there's a flow to to a game finding itself there's also a uh like it's hard to define what is fun and of course Mm -hmm. for every player that's different but uh there's plenty of times where i'm like oh i have this perfect game design and it all mathematically works i put on there it worked perfectly and i'm like but that wasn't fun at all yeah yeah (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I definitely agree with that. And I, I kind of picked up the phrase, like, follow the fun. You know, sometimes you even might think this is the star of the game. And then you see people interacting and they get excited about something else. And you're like, oh, that's the star of the game. Like, you have to kind of, like, respect, like, the, the table never lies. Yeah. You know, so you so you go like, oh, that's the fun thing. What things are getting in the way of that? What things took too long to get there? You know, what, why aren't we like circling back or finding ways to flip it on its head? And, and so I, I agree with you. That's so important to try to watch for. And, and sometimes it's hard because early on things are so raw. You, you're only getting glimmers of what's fun. Um, and so it, 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 that's part of the kind of peeling back and carving away. I know for myself, I kind of throw usually too much in and then I need to start chipping away at it. Kind of like... Yeah. You know, you're carving at some cool looking rock. There's a statue in there, but it's it's pretty ugly so far. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I um I I find that if I think of just myself as the audience, I might just make myself happy. But what I like to do is try to define like the people who like this and this mm. and this yeah. and these aspects of that game yeah. that they're finding that part fun and then I try to, you know, point towards that and really build on that. So, um, yeah, it's important to identify that fun, right? So at what point, one of the things I learned from Richard when we were going through Batman was like, you're designing something and there's just something missing, right? Mm -hmm. There's something missing, but you don't know what that is. And it could be because it hasn't come to mind yet. You haven't played a game to remind you of it yet. So sure. he takes a lot of the stuff and like, like I have a shelf of games that are just waiting to be completed. At sure. what point do you shelve it for a little while? Like I know yeah. you work with many designers. Yeah. Been- yeah. And that's part of it. That's part of why. Cause early on, especially at 17, you just worked on just like the one idea and, and there's no uh, shame in doing that. But for me, I found my process was better if I worked on some different games at different stages. And then I would find even if I'm trying to solve one problem, I might actually come up with a solution for something else. Mm-hmm. Or I might not, because I put it on the back burner, I can use the analogy like, uh, I love cooking. And some, sometimes things just need to simmer. Like you just need the flavors to just kind of cook down. And so same thing, like I just think, Sometimes I'm working on a dish and it's not all coming together or I'm missing a spice or whatever to it. So then it's like, okay, push it on the back burner, start working, focusing on the next thing, start chopping some stuff, start getting some other stuff ready and it'll come. But another great place is play testing. So I, even if it's on my back burner, it's still in my rotation of games to play test. Uh, especially I try to do, and we haven't been meeting lately, but one of the fun things would be asking play testers, like, what do you want to play? And if a game gets requested again, like it hasn't come out for a bit, 
and they get requested, and then that's a good sign. Oh, there's still something there. People are still thinking about it. Mm-hmm. And then with fresh eyes, when it comes back out, a play tester might come up with just like a nice question or a, or a suggestion. It doesn't even have to be that suggestion that's the answer, but that could be the springboard right to help yeah. you kind of go like oh and what you're getting at i now see like mm-hmm. i think it's really important don't just try to fix whatever or do whatever someone suggests especially when you play test with designers because every designer is telling you how to make a game that they'd make but instead read between the lines and go like oh and you have a problem with that because of this problem mm-hmm. and now how do i want to answer that problem and that's where you get to inject yourself like i really agree with chris like I try to design games where I'm trying to capture a certain audience and make sure they have a good time. And then I get to, when it's the fine tuning, get to make kind of my own personal preference choices. Like that's where I go like, well, if we're at a fork in the road. I'm going to try my, what I'd like most first. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, if that doesn't work, then start trying some other ideas. But mm-hmm. that, that's where I would land and why I would push something to the back burner. So I try to work on different games. And like you mentioned too, I work with a bunch of different people. So the funny part about that too, is it helps me kind of just like walk away from an idea sometimes like, Oh, maybe it's Tuesday and I'm working with Adrian. And then I get a phone call after hours on Wednesday with Erica, you know, she's a teacher. And so she's been thinking the last few days about a game and all of a sudden I can go back and say like, Oh, you were thinking about that. Oh, like, okay, let's start talking and thinking about that game. So it helps me kind of like stop thinking about something and start thinking about a new problem. Yeah. It forces you to re rethink, put it away. Yeah. yeah. So how do you deal with, um, uh, I've only co-designed with two other designers so far. Um, and uh, one of them is my partner, Aaron. We design a lot of stuff together. Uh, and even if it's just my own title, you know, she still has some say and stuff. Yeah. Because she's the first one to help me play test. Um, but I, the game that I was talking about, where I just got it in my head, I started making it stuff. I ran in there and I was like hey I'm stealing your idea from a game we were trying to make a while back sure and you know that game wasn't doing anything and she was like yeah sure fine and then she got involved and now it's going to be more of a uh, co-design thing which is awesome but um my question is like do you do that can you do that how do you feel about doing that like this thing that I'm working with person a would work well even better with person b like sure yeah, that's trickier, especially when they're different people. I think that's harder, but it's, again, just about communication, like talking. It might mean bringing all parties together. Like maybe that's a three-person design then. I, it's not my ideal scenario, but sometimes that might just be the solution. Um, open communication of just kind of like, how do you feel about that? I think that's really important. You don't want to just kind of like, oh, surprise. Um, so or that's where people feel like they've been, you know, their ideas have been stolen and, and things like that. And, and that's obviously not anyone's intent. Right. Oh, Mike. Right, just like that. Yeah. It looked like uh, Daryl got uh, frozen there. I was afraid it was me at first. <clears throat> huh? Well, there he is. There he is. There you go. Oh, sorry about that. I don't, it might be my internet. It could right. be me. I, I just got a message that said internet connection is unstable. Perfect. That sounds exciting. Yeah. Um, That's the full yeah, on the edge. It knows you're on the show now. That's what's going on. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't know where I cut out, but yeah, communication is key. I think also maybe it's just like, for me at least, sometimes it just might mean like saying to a designer, like, I'm not digging it here but I still really like this part of it. So let's like, just kind of like kill it and maybe take that. I, I, I remember hearing uh, um, my, Matt Leacock and Eric Lang answer this question. And they said, you know, when you get stuck and you have a part in a game, like, what do you do? And um, Matt Leacock said like, Oh, you know, I, I find the core of the game. I cut everything else away and I start working again from that. And then Eric Lang was like, I do the opposite. I cut the heart out of it, like where I started from, and I chuck it. Because whatever I came up with next is like, that was just a starting point. And to me, that just illustrates like two amazing designers doing it in completely different ways. Mm -hmm. And that's just what you do sometimes. Like you just take something at whatever reason 
and then you try to make it work. So I, I often will say, you know, this game didn't really work, but this part was fun. So let's, yeah. let's just work with that. Yeah. I, I think the best uh, way to say it is, uh, or at least from my opinion, is that uh, basically do whatever it is that's going to motivate you to keep going. Yeah. Like if the core is what interested you, then do it that method. If you're more interested in the new stuff you've added, do, go the other way. But yeah. whatever it is that just keeps you going and going and working at it, yeah. keep chipping away, right? Yeah. <laughs> you are being asked, Mike, is that peanut butter whiskey? <laughs> wow. Like TPH games. No, that was Friday night. Um, no, it's it's not peanut butter whiskey. Is that what is that what you drink at a leprechauns or something? Is that like? <laughs> no, th- this is this is just sweet gold in here. It's cool. Um, is that Dan that's asking? Uh, DPH games. Dan, yeah, DPH games. Yeah, it's not not peanut butter. You got to join me on Friday for the peanut butter whiskey talk. That's what we'll do. <laughs> this is just uh, it's Jack Honey and Ginger. Uh, Jack Fire and Ginger tonight. Ooh, yeah. spicy. Yeah. Figured why not? I like it. Dan. Thanks for joining in, Dan. Um, okay, so uh, now that you, I think you were about to move that over to the Batman game and ask about how that was applied to it. Well, and we can wait until, you- <laughs> like, I think, I think that's going to tie into a little bit of the, the solo um the solo game too, because originally it was solo, and one of the things that we wanted to talk about was solo games um, versus multiplayer versus co-op versus multiplayer solitaire, um, which we can jump around because that's what we do in the show anyway. Because um, what are show notes but to be broken? No, we this... have to know that we jump around on the show. Right, <laughs> it is. We it is it is. Um, well, we're giving them a little peek behind the curtain. There are show notes. We we don't follow them. There are no curtains. Yeah, they're just guidelines. They're like rules, right? <laughs> Rule books. They're just they're meant they're meant to be broken. Um, I post. Right. <laughs> so you have a game, um, co-designed around uh, the Batman. So now we have something else in common around the Batman universe. Um, that was originally solo. So I'm curious, how did you go about co-designing a solo game? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the funny part is. Um, kind of like winding back <clears throat> and people are sometimes uh, curious like how do you get to work on licensed games uh, in general and you've had the opportunity and I've, I've got to work on a few and I'm very thankful for that this opportunity came together just because of luck being in the right spot at the right time um, which is sometimes it's better to be lucky than good um, but I went to New York Toy Fair, and one of the reasons I go to conventions, and I'm sure we'll circle back and talk about conventions because I was in the show notes too, um, was... Uh, hey, show notes exist. See? Yeah. Uh, or at least I'm referencing them. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, I went to New York Toy Fair, and New York Toy Fair, for anyone who's not familiar with, is, is not a consumer show. It's not like you don't go there and like see games and buy them. It's a, it's a business show. It's a, it, it's a you know retailers are going around and people are making like business decisions. Everyone's in suits. It like the first time I went, I was shocked because I'm like, I'm a gamer. I'm wearing hats and a short and a hoodie. Like what, what's happening? All these fancy dressed up people. What's well, mass market um, retailers too. Right? And yeah. And it's especially mass market. Exactly. There's a lot of big booths and big companies. And, um, and so being there, I ended up meeting cryptozoic and we actually asked, them that's how we got our badges and uh erica boyora someone who i do some co-design with had done a game for them uh steven universe the card game and so we went to meet up with them and get our badges so we could walk around and pretend like we're supposed to be there uh and then do all our meetings and and not really represent cryptozoic in any way so i'm sure i'm sure that's not really how the badges are supposed to be used but it happens all the time So uh, while there, I just got in this conversation with a gentleman, uh, uh, Adam Splendido, who actually doesn't work for Cryptozoic anymore. He works for the op and is like vice president of something important, like marketing or creative (laughs) director or something like that. Sorry, Adam, if you watch this. and It makes me wish I had business cards. Right. Director of something important. Something important. (laughs) Um, and, And a super awesome dude. And we just got geeking out and talking about things we liked and 
dream licenses and and in our conversation he kind of was like well i actually have a project in mind that uh i was curious to hear like if you're a fan and i did mention that i was like a big fan of comics and and batman was one of the specific licenses i mentioned that is obviously amazing and uh and long story short we got chatting about which ones were our favorite titles and i mentioned you know frank miller's dark knight returns is pretty epic and and i in that conversation, we got chatting about how, you know, there's certain licenses that lend themselves well to be translated into games. And then what they get translated into kind of lends themselves in natural ways. And I got to be a developer, talking about Kevin Wilson earlier, uh, one of my first gigs was being a developer for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles game that he designed for IDW, which I love. And uh, he did this really great mechanic of when you're the turtles, um you kind of roll your dice and their actions and the dice on your left then the turtle on your left can use and the the dice on your right the turtle on your right can use and it really feels like you're kind of like fighting side to side and like kind of helping each other out like punching the guy in front of you you know punching the guy behind you and so i i thought like oh it lends itself really well to being like a multiplayer game because everyone wants one of the turtles and they yeah they're all a little different but also they're all kind of equal strength and again, I say all this to say that when we were talking about Batman, I was like, especially Dark Knight Returns, there's other Batman titles that there's a lot of cool characters doing stuff, but especially Dark Knight Returns, that story is so focused on Batman just kind of like coming out of retirement and getting dragged and beat up and lifting himself up and being this gritty badass kind of punching his way through the story. Um and I said, like, that would be a really cool game, but I, I really think it would be a sellout move uh, to make it like this four or five player smash them up game. Like, I just I just don't see it. And he said, well, what if we could convince Cryptozoic to do a one player? And I was like, well, the irony is I don't really play a lot of one players. I usually play video games when I want to play uh, one player. But that would be a title I would be willing to try to figure that out. And long story fast forward it started working in the background he pitched it they got approvals they came back to me they were like are you serious about that because we are actually serious about trying that out uh i also found out that um my co-designer morgan donteville who's just a good friend and uh amazing person he works actually as a creative director for Catan uh studios and uh i was hanging out with him and i found out that he actually worked for dc for a number of years um, and actually is a credited editor on a ton of their books, including um, Batman Hush awesome. um, and a few other like really epic Batman titles. And I was just like, what? Knowing that in the back of my mind, I know this other opportunity is kind of starting to actually gain some steam. And I asked him, like, would you ever want to do that? And he's like, well, of course, I would be like combining like two of my loves. And I was like, well, let's just do it. Like, why don't you help me figure this out? So it all kind of just came together and we were like, okay, let's, let's make this game. And then all of a sudden we sat down and we're like, oh crap, we got to make a solo game now. Uh, <laughs> neither of us being solo gamers, you know, it's like I have friends or I've played a solo mode to learn a game maybe before game night, but I'm not like the target demo. I'm not like listening to low player count every every week and and like contributing so i was like oh well a we're gonna have to involve some other people <laughs> to play test and b let's tackle the design of like well let's make a solo game that maybe we would like mm. so what would that mean so that was also kind of like a good challenge and then for play testing COVID hit and we were like well the only game we can really always play test is the solo game that each of us have <laughs> so I play tests on my own. He played tests on his own. We talked to each other. At least it was like, oh, we're not dependent on play test nights. So while everything else kind of dried up, that was the one game that we could kind of keep slogging through, especially early COVID days, to keep keep this, the design going. Yeah, yeah it's no, that, to do it digitally. Sounds... So that's my long-winded answer to that. <laughs> I don't even know if I answered your original question. It doesn't even matter. Yeah, that was just fun to hear. Yeah, um, agreed. Uh, just a side note, and we'll get back to it. Uh, Michael in the chat says that Leonardo is the greatest turtle. I agree. 
I mean, there's some arguments. There's some arguments. I, I have strong turtle opinions. I will what, I will say what, Leonardo's up there. What's everybody's favorite? Though? You gotta have a favorite. Donatello. Right? No, Leonardo's it's got, got too much leadership responsibility. Donatello <laughs> always has the cool tech. Yeah, Donnie was good. Um, I gotta go at Raph though. What? Oh, you angry, angry man. That yep. just means you have a lot of rage inside. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Not a Mikey event. fan in, on the four forty-two. Okay. No Mikeys. No Mikeys. No, Mikey was fun. Mikey is the comic relief. Yeah. He's the Jar Jar Binks. Oh, oh God. don't say to ruin don't, the don't episode you, with don't you Jar Jar put that on him. Uh, oh. no, no, no. I just wanted to get yelled at. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you're gonna get a reaction for that for sure. <laughs> we just lost half our viewers. Two, two people <laughs> just. Left. So now we're down to one. <laughs> Uh, in the, when you when you do delete, you can just delete that moment. Yeah, yeah. rub that right on. That. <laughs> and then that's the only part. That's the only part that makes it. Uh, What's yours, well, Chris? What was it? What's yours? Who's Leonardo. who's your turtle? You're a Leo. You know? Leo. The leader. The leader. Yeah, but see, look look at how nice and spread out that is, right? Leo, Donnie, Raph. Mm -hmm. Just clear, okay. kind of like they got their bends. Yeah. I, I just I'm I'm a huge turtles fan, but I just think it really shows like this is an example of a property that's really meant for a bunch of people to get to play together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that was a uh, I mean that was a great point. <laughs> I'm getting yelled at for the Jar Jar comment. <laughs> Good, give it to him. Give him the business. Yeah. <laughs> um, give him some one ratings. That was a great point about Batman because I've thought about that in other IPs before too. Like, oh, it'd be great to have this or Indiana mm -hmm. Jones or you know, right. Anything like that, and then you're like, "But who is everybody else playing?" Like, yeah, one yeah. person gets to be Indiana or Doctor right. Who or whatever, yeah. and everybody else has to play the side characters. Or you do the thing where, you know, Sherlock Holmes is missing, and you're yep. all the side, you yeah. know, totally. Kind of thing. And yeah, I mean, there are definitely the to capture the the theme, right? Yep. I mean, that's definitely like there's different solutions. Co-op is obviously like a, a big solution that people use. Mm -hmm. um, and I get that. I just I just really like I really want to be Batman. So like I want sidekicks to help me when I want their help. Like so it just like that kind of really drove our design. And then we did actually um, with funding, we added the secret surprise of giving everyone a 1v1 mode with the Kickstarter. And that was because we always kind of had in the back of our mind pretty early on, we discovered an angle that we were like, oh, actually, we're, we're really like kind of making villains and adversaries this automated process that you're working against. Mm -hmm. And there is this space to do 1v1 mode where someone can be the collective bad against mm -hmm. Batman. And mm -hmm. so like as we were designing things, we'd be like, oh, that's also something that could be in 1v1 mode. But oh, that's not our priority right now. So we just kept designing the game and then and then with the announcement we kind of like we were even kind of waiting to see like well if maybe the game is successful maybe that would be a product down the road hmm. and then a lot of people asked for it and we thought well okay and like we asked the publisher like how much room on the punch board can we get how much room in the rule book can we add um to be able to include this and it was so kind of cost effective enough that we were like if you're going to throw this in we'd really like it to be free and they were like yeah that's a fun idea hmm. So, so then we're like, Hey, we're just throwing in also a one V one mode. So I was excited about that. And, and I think it's, we're, we're right now in initial ideas of like kind of testing the ideas that we thought of. Mm -hmm. And so we haven't like nailed it down, but I feel very confident that it'll be actually a really a fun yeah, version the, of it. The two player aspect is what grabbed me. I mean, like you, I don't actually solo game unless if I do that, I just video game mm -hmm. uh, so set up for it, basically. Sure. Um, and I'm also, you know, I, I'm, I'm blessed to have a partner that I could just play games with. And yeah. Come up and play board games. So, you know, it, even if I were to start setting up a game to play solo, she'd sit down and go, oh, a game. And now I'm playing. Right. And so that's where we were kind of like, actually, it's just kind of fun that like the things that were working against you, someone could choose that. And that actually even made it more fun because now we, there's a little bit of double think, a little bit of like, are you going to do this? Or are you going to do that? Mm -hmm. And now you're like, instead of wondering that about a deck, you're wondering about that. The person straight across from you which is always chat, fun chat wants to know how do you go about creating tension in a solo game sure great question. yeah that's a great question and um the echo 
we didn't think this like we didn't have like a plan like oh this is how we're gonna add tension we just started making stuff and and you know i'd love to take credit and say like we were really intentional and we had like this professional plan on how to do it but instead we found it and then now like i could act like we always meant to do this but what we realized was that we wanted to take the angle of like say pandemic where a bunch of crap is happening and you got to put out fires but on top of it we wanted to layer on that sure there's some different ways that you can lose but then there's also a bunch of positive things you want to go chase after so we made a whole bunch of like mini quests that make you more powerful and then there's this tension line we think of like when you have to be dealing with gotham's burning while also kind of like getting back in the swing of things because you're coming out of retirement you're starting to get your groove and you're starting to get some cool equipment and tech and some sidekicks and so how much do you kind of work on improving those things while also dealing with kind of the crap that's all over gotham and the press is pulling you down the mutants are getting in your way and the cops are even getting in your way and so like these crooked cops are like sometimes dealing with the mutants but sometimes they're allowing riots to happen and the press is like always criticizing you and so like we tried to kind of move all those valves and kind of create that they keep bubbling up on you and so just like kind of whack-a-mole you deal with this thing and all of a sudden somewhere else you got to deal with while at the same time you're tempted to be like oh but you know it'd be really nice to get that slingshot for robin because then robin could kick butt a little bit more so let's go deal with getting you know robin's slingshot and hope that those fires over there we can deal with even better because we're more powerful by then or do we go deal with it now so that that's kind of for us like where we found the tension in the game and then also one of the things that we've added is um there's kind of two setup modes. There's one where you can just like see, we have these like downloadable maps and you can set it up on easy, medium or hard type mode. And then there's some where there's like rules where it's almost puzzly. Mm-hmm. Like we'll say like, you need to cover this symbol X amount of times or, and so like, even with repeat play, you can kind of try to see like, oh, is, is I, I'm almost playing during setup because I'm kind of going like, how could I make this puzzle and then plan ahead kind of my route Mm. while then events keep popping up and the events that pop up in the, in the game you choose so every game there's two parts on a card there's the actions that that you have detective and fight actions but on the bottom are events and every every you draw three cards and you pick one of them to be an event and you get to keep two so you're and then those get shuffled up and then in the 1v1 mode you pass them to the other person and they're getting to choose so that's also like attention moment of like oh i want this card because it's awesome but it's actually a really easy event to deal with so maybe i'll give that to you and you know and so that that as well i think it's really fun is kind of like you only kind of have yourself to blame if it kicks your ass because you did it to yourself so that was also kind of fun we should mention by the way that this game uh, that you're talking about is on kickstarter right now Mm -hmm. Uh, and it ends when thursday so, yeah right. thursday yeah so we just have uh kind of three and a half days 19th i think yeah 19th 19th is yeah. it the 18th um i don't know don't ask me <laughs> business questions yeah i guess we should get there right i know it's thursday. online people, people should go don't, check it out that's, yeah. what, that's what um chad is also asking they have good questions here better than us mike um i love it <laughs> You, have a no, you don't say that. You take the credit for it. No. That's well, unfortunately, <laughs> anybody can say it. <laughs> you have a variety of themes. So, does theme come first or mechanics? It's part. Sure. Of that. Yeah, I mean that's always a fun question, um, and I've heard better answers than mine. Uh, I always like to steal John Gilmore's answer, as he says that he designs from experience first, and I just think that sounds so good and so cool. And I don't do that, but I wish I did that because it sounds really like, I don't know, professional. Uh, But I just go with whatever, kind of earlier you mentioned, like whatever will push you forward. So, I mean, it could literally be like a pun or a title and I might start designing something off of that pun. Uh, A lot of the times for me, it's component first. So I might just see like something cool as a component and think about it. I I just had this experience actually on the weekend. Uh, I was in uh, Winners, which is the equivalent of Marshalls in the States. I just, uh, Mike knows this. I just discovered they have some geeky tiki's 
Um, so now I'm like regularly checking uh, for more geeky deekies because uh, they're hard to get in Canada. Um, and I'm obsessed, but I digress. You'd also just get them in the U.S. and have them shipped to me. And well, that, I mean, I feel like I have a room in your house full of stuff. Oh, you do. Uh, so I'm going to start having to pay rent for a room. Um, but I, um, yeah, I was at Winners and uh, a component I just uh, saw and I fell in love with. And now I got to come up with a game with this. So if, if one of you want to co-design this with me, let me know. But I found some colorful dreidels. Do you know what a dreidel is? Mm-hmm. Okay. For anyone who doesn't know, it's basically a spinner top attached to a D4, like, because it's going to flop on one of the sides. And uh, I got thinking like, oh, it'd be really fun if there was a mechanic where you could kind of um, progress the the dreidel like a a dice 4G type thing, but also where the spinner falls in points matters. So you're trying to get the action to show that you want the dreidel itself is a certain color and then the direction matters. And I was thinking like, depending on which way it falls, it would like tell that colored thing to move in that direction, like North, South, East, West, while also in action. And so it'd be like this fun little kind of like chaos agent of telling a few different data points, but completely just because I was staring at dreidels. Sure. And so I was like, how could that be a game component? Like usually I'm in the clearance section and I always come out with like just weird random things. And Tanya, my wife, was just kind of like, what crap did you buy now? Like that better just stay in the office because I just like start hoarding weird, weird things. But yeah, that, that might inspire something. So I just say whatever inspires or gets the wheels turning and then just push it forward. Like just start making stuff out of it. That's, that's my design philosophy. You know, one of the... Cool. You put the link to the Kickstarter in there. Good, good go. I did. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Yeah, follow the link to the Kickstarter. It it says the nineteenth, um, north of three hundred thousand, thirty one, almost thirty two hundred backers. It's doing really well. Nice. Congratulations. Thanks. Um, speaking about inspiration, um, Adrian and I are working on a game <clears throat> that came from me doing the dishes one day. Um, so I was it's doing a deck, the dishes. It's a deck builder. You're saying. It's a deck builder. Yeah, <laughs> it's a dexterity. Uh, no um no i was doing the dishes and outside the window in the backyard i saw there was a bird feeder and a chipmunk came up the fence and started eating at the bird feeder and then another chipmunk came and chased the other chipmunk out and started eating at the bird feeder and i'm like wow all right so chipmunks like this is a thing and i came up with some kind of idea talked to adrian before base camp i think which is yep. now, what two years ago yeah um, yeah so inspiration can come from anywhere I actually have to blame. I, I I don't know if I ever told you this, but he rejected uh, a game pitch I pitched him because he was like, "No, I'm already committed to making one with Mike." Because I made a game called Chip Monks with a space in between, and they're little chip chip monks running around monastery grounds and they're collecting poker chips. And I was making this game for a publisher, and the publisher ended up selling the rights back to me because they're they closed down. And then I went to Adrian and I was like, hey, do you want to finish this design with me? And he said, no, I'm already doing a chipmunk game. <laughs> so, so you have to blame, you cherry picked my, my co-designer away from me. But I, it's, it's, it's a good thing. He you was just like conflict of interest. He was like, I can't, I, can't, uh, I can't be making competitive chipmunk games. That's funny. Uh, today, uh, just maybe about an hour before we started filming this, Aaron and I were walking around feeding squirrels in our apartments. We started talking about, hey, we can make the game about squirrels, you know. Nice. And you said something about components, and I thought, I never do that. But then in that same walk, I looked and saw a dandelion. I was like, I wonder if you can make a game about a dandelion. It's Mm -hmm. not a component, but it's still the same thing. Yeah, that was, yeah. That that inspired, for instance, Boss, um, a game I co-designed with Erica Bioris. That game was, yeah, yes. I mean, he secretly, he, oh man, I feel so bad about this. I was I, I, <laughs> you were ready. I was awesome. I, I one time hinted on an interview. If you look really close on the cover, you can find him. And I, I just, I got used to saying that as a joke. And my buddy, Carl, um, a great game designer, and he's a local uh, play tester of mine. One day he came, he told me he spent hours searching for it and i was like oh i was just joking dude i'm so sorry but anyways bosk um is about um leaves 
blowing in this beautiful kind of park area. And again, it was just like I was sitting at a red light and I just watched leaves falling and they were falling in the sidewalk area in the middle of the intersection. And, and I was just kind of like, oh, I'm seeing lines and I'm seeing leaves dropping into spots and thought like, oh, area control. And I so an funny, argument you know, could be made that uh, on both sides that that is theme and mechanics at the same time, right? Sure. Just like you said, you said, oh, area control. Like that's the right. first thing that popped in your head. Right. But also there's already the theme. Yeah. Yeah. So. And so that's definitely like, I obviously both matter and whatever kind of side you get excited and start pushing it forward. It could have changed. Like I'm also, I've had games reskinned and that might even bring new ideas in, but that's usually where I want to start from. And I find that also helps like rules will become intuitive and like things will make sense and and then that helps kind of like push a game forward yeah i i mean uh, asking for troubles was made because i saw a commercial where it was just a blank white background and they used orange text and i was like man i really like orange right and i just yelled into the other room i said we should design a game that's nothing but orange that's what started the whole thing. amazing Amazing. And I do think of your game when I think orange. <laughs> no, legit. I have said that. Oh, the awesome. orange game. <laughs> yes, it's yeah. the orange game. We should have subtitled it. Um, but yeah, uh, I think I think the real thing is, is if you spend as much time as I guess all of us do designing games and thinking about games, pretty much every single thing you see in front of you just starts becoming that inspiration most of the time it doesn't become anything no i'm gonna make a dandelion game yeah probably. maybe maybe but <laughs> that doesn't mean you know it gets your mind working and it yep. like you said it could be rethemed it could be attached to something else yeah well and and this is where like uh sometimes new designers or just anyone asks the question like don't you worry someone's gonna steal your idea i have so many ideas that i want to chase down that like it's some, sometimes when I do find a game, sure, there's maybe like a grieving moment of just like, ah, oh, man, that game came out. And then the next thought is usually, oh, but I don't have to design that game anymore because that's been made and I can go work on one of the other ideas. Like, And then I'll end up playing it and be like, oh, this was nothing like what I was thinking. So then there's even space to make that game. So like, that's why I encourage people like still play the game and see how your idea might be different and don't sweat it like, the 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 key is like yes it, it, you need a good idea but it's the execution the execution is what matters because it's a grind it's a lot of work and it's a long time before that game becomes a product and gets out in the world so you got to stick to it and you got to work hard and that work is what you know makes a game yeah i think you have to enjoy the work to yeah. be a game designer because it yep. It is a lot of work, and as we all know, it's not a, uh, you don't get rich off of, uh, well, most of the time, you don't get rich off of one game. I mean, none of us has made Gloomhaven or anything like that. Right, exactly. I'm still waiting for my ticket to ride, but, uh, you know, meanwhile, it's, it's still a really fun uh, craft, and I really enjoy getting to work in it and i think it scratches a lot of different interests and so it's like this cool puzzle that's different every time where you get to kind of work your brain and your imagination and your creative side in in a bunch of different directions at the same time that that brings up a question uh, we could ask both of you um do you think there could be another ticket to ride in this kind of game environment that we have now i mean it's totally right right I think it cracks. I think it cracks a different way. Like I, I have heard a lot of people say, like an ever. There's no such thing as an evergreen anymore because back then there were so few games. But I actually, I don't agree with that. I actually, I think there's space for evergreens, but they just look different. Like it's just they. It might kind of evolve or grow in a different way. I even point to Sagrada for me. Not that it's a ticket to ride, uh, but like for us, like it just kept having some life. And it found its place and it found some people and it became an app as well. And we're excited. Like we're doing a legacy game of Sagrada and that we hope people will really get excited about in a new way. And, and so for us, we have that journey. And I think other games are doing that. Like they're just finding, uh, I look at something like Chronicles of Crime, like 
they're just kind of like crushing it right now. I think that's a, an example of a game that they're now putting out more and more stuff and it's affordable and people just think of it iconically, like with the, like kind of looking around stuff. And I think there's just games that there'll be a few that are innovative or it just captures a theme or an emotion really well. And people will go like, that's a hit. Fog of Love is like an example of a product that was just like really unique and it just like took off um, internationally as well, especially. And kind of like, I think there's space for games that like really capture emotion and that like we're with the growth, we have potential for like really cool different things as well that we're not even thinking about. Like we're, we're more talking about like, Oh, is roll and move going to last? But like, there's a whole, there's other categories that we haven't, even started to make that I think will take off and be the evergreen of a new category. I'll tell you in the, in the game classroom, when we gave those students uh, talking about creativity and coming up from, from wherever um, giving those students 40 minutes or up to 60 minutes to do a design challenge with stuff that like we took dice away. You can't have dice in your games. Um, You had to pick a game, a mechanism that we went over that day and you had to make a game to show us that you knew what that mechanism was. And some of the things that these, these 15, 16 year olds are making were just mind blowing. Like you would never think of from a design perspective that they were using this thing in such an innovative way. That was like, wow, that's, that's really smart. Yeah. Hmm. It's amazing. Also uh, you had mentioned earlier about, um, thinking about things different ways. One of my favorite things is the pandemic events at conventions, mm. running it so many years down at uh, Dice Tower Con. Um, Chris and I might've talked about this. I know Daryl and I have, have mentioned this. Um, running the pandemic survival things at, at a convention, you'd have 12 teams of two. Um, so 24 people in the same room and they're all rocking the same deck, same infection deck, same rolls, same draws, same everything. And what being the person that kind of oversees what's going on with, with everyone else, making sure the rules are adhered to looking around at the 12 different boards and looking at the same game played so differently. It was just, it's one of my favorite moments in games. It's the same thing with the same draw at the same time. And you'll hear like the fun part is when you go to infect the city I'll let them know like, all right, it's black. And you'll hear half the, the room just <gasps> and stop breathing for a second. But then the other half of the room's like, ah, oh, cause they're all okay with it. And they have different um, research stations in different cities because it's just, it's so amazing to watch the same game played so differently. It's, I've never seen anything like it. I don't, I don't know if you know this actually, Michael, but I was part of the very first one. Mm-hmm. I, okay, I did tell you yeah, this. I think okay. that's how we but, got on the subject. Oh, that's funny. So, yeah. So, the cool part about um, Z-Man at the time had the rights, and, and at the time, Z-Man was owned by uh, a Canadian company, and we tested it for the very first time at Fan Expo in Toronto, this idea. And I remember thinking at the time, like, is this really going to work? Like, are different people really going to have that much of a different experience? And it was just like you described, like, just drastically different like a card pull might just utterly destroy one table and another table is like whatever yep. and it was just like how are, like just because of people's choices yep. and we really hammed it up like we were in like lab coats and we like like quarantine off the table and say like oh sorry you need to get away from here this zone's toxic and yep. and like really have fun with it yep. and it became like a real spectacle and a real fun moment we we actually were working on and I almost joined staff with them of a book of different scenarios and kits that you could rent. And the idea was even that you could like rent 12 copies or whatever and run these different events at like a big outing or a big event. And um, that was like something they were kind of exploring at the time. It didn't work out, but it just shows like even just that was like a really fun twist on a gaming experience. And we would have people walking by that were just at Fan Expo for some different geekdom reason and they were like what's going on over here and i i think they converted so many people into trying pandemic there were so many people that i would say like i described the game and it blew their mind there was even just a co-op mm-hmm. you know like people that were like oh i don't have to play a game and there's no loser at the table or we at least all lose together like that alone was like yeah. so um 
there's just like we're just scratching the surface like video games has gone mainstream but board games i still think is nowhere close to being kind of in the popular knowledge of like that it's get it's growing but i just think like it's not like i think we're gonna get to the place like how we heard legends of germany when Catan was like in every home like i think like there's gonna be some games like that where it's just like everyone in north america is gonna be like oh i I, I have that game. Everyone has that game. Well, like Monopoly. Yeah. No, but, not but, like Monopoly. But <laughs> maybe, well, you know what? Monopoly just announced three really exciting games I'm super pumped about. One is Monopoly Builder. And oh, basically, oh. they described it as Catan meets Monopoly. So it's like resource management and everything. Mm-hmm. That sounds super cool. They also did one. I can't remember. There was one about uh, Crooked Cash. I think it's called Monopoly Crooked Cash. And it's all about counterfeit money and like how some of your money's counterfeit. So while you're paying for things, you're like sometimes trying to sneak by fake money. I hope it's more like party game ish because that just sounds great. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think like even like leveraging those things that people know, but then giving them a good game experience, taking like even just one or two really good mechanics and weaving them into that world, I think is the future. Like I think a ton of people are going to be like, like Monopoly Deal is a really good game. Yeah. As a card so, game, it's yeah. good. So uh, talking about the pandemic, uh, 24 people, uh, 12 games going on, you could do, I guess they could do that uh, virtually, right? Mm-hmm. Like if you connected with game groups. Easily, yeah. The Zoom thing, you could have someone running it. It'd be really fascinating. That sounds like it'd be like the perfect way to play test that game. Right. Because if everybody does the same thing, then it's not good. Yeah. You have to keep working it till right. there's reasons and thoughts of going in different directions. Yeah. That's yeah. A- well, and I feel like there's certain games, even like like Coup, that would be hilarious if you did like pocket cams and did like poker style. Like you could do those kind of things with like commentators. Yeah. Like, oh, I can't believe they're bluffing. They got a Duke. <laughs> like that would just be hilarious. Yeah, that would be good. It makes me think of something I was talking about on another podcast. Um, someone was talking about how no one watches um, playthroughs, like uh, not like live playthroughs, like, oh, we're going to play this game and stuff. And I said, maybe part of the problem is that when you're playing the game, you are ki- you can't entertain, you can't talk to the camera, all that stuff, you know. And maybe instead of having the players talk to the camera, you need commentators. Yep. And you just let the players do their thing, you know, like, yeah, like World let them play. Yeah. yeah. Let them play and then, you know, have funny commentary. No, that's mm-hmm. harder to find. People are be funny. Sure. No, that, that is a skill set, but I think there's opportunity there. And actually tying into something on your show notes, Ooh. I think clubhouse could be incorporated into a solution like this, because I think clubhouse is an example for anyone who doesn't know clubhouse is a, an app, uh, currently only ios uh um app uh they're working on android and a few other things so don't hear me saying like exclusivity is a good thing i would love for more people on there but right now um in its early stages and and it's an auditory communal experience where people go into rooms virtual rooms and you can interact and a lot of people describe it as almost like an interactive podcast um some people say like oh well why wouldn't you just use discord Sure. Discord's great too. Um, the, the big difference is that you can kind of discover each other. It kind of almost harkens back to the early feelings of like Facebook where you would like start finding friends and finding old connections and finding topics that you kind of are really into, but you didn't even realize you were until you saw it and things like that. Well, Clubhouse to me is there's all these rooms going on at different times and you can kind of find people to follow them. And then you can just wander in a room. And no pressure. You don't have to talk. You can just listen to the conversation going on. Mm -hmm. Nothing's being recorded, but you can also join the conversation. You can kind of raise your hand and all of a sudden be involved. Ask that question that was on the tip of your head that, you know, if you don't have that answered, you'd just be so distracted. You'd you'd walk away from the podcast anyways. Well, now you could ask it right away or you could clarify something. And to me, that's like what you're suggesting, like watching something and being able, there was like some commentator or some people there that we're also watching that you could talk about the experience you were watching. That could be kind of like this group interactive way where sometimes it happens with like, say a Twitch, but it's all just in the chat. 
what I love about Clubhouse is that, that it's it's the communal moment of like interacting and that conversation can kind of like spin off into a really fun thing. So uh, I, I think Clubhouse is just an example of things like that that will come that help us as humans connect even more in different ways. And if it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for you. But there's there's some that I think will help reconnect us and especially during COVID where we've been so separated and so isolated, it feels nice to have like a little human connection again. Yeah. Sounds like a constant convention where panels are going on constantly. Yeah. I almost, I describe it almost like the bar at the convention. So it's a very much like, Hey, what were you just listening to? And you could join in that discussion and then like, Oh, you, you hear someone talking about something else and you could just kind of like wander over to that table and you got your beer in hand and you're like, Oh, what were you at? And so <laughs> To me, it's very much like you're co-learning. There could be organized stuff and it's usually pretty casual, but there are some very organized speakers and organized topics and groups as well. But it's there's something nice about the casual and organic element to it that, uh, you know, I, I hope they don't lose. I hope that as it grows, they still find ways to foster like positivity. It's also really nice to be like, I feel like sadly a lot of social media is getting a little toxic, especially as we're all isolated. We're like kind of firing arrows at each other. And so there's something nice about like hearing a human voice instead of reading a computer screen. There's something nice about it's not being recorded or misquoted against anyone um, that you can just flat out right away. Like ask, like, do you mean that? Like (laughs) there's something really like healthy about that instead of just kind of sadly, um, the social media things that we have, we've almost like taken them for granted and some of them have skewed into like everything we can kind of like weaponize and, and twist even good things into bad things. So, so yeah, it's nice. And maybe, maybe it's the honeymoon phase of clubhouse for me, but, uh, but it's enjoyable. It kind of sounds like what I had hoped. And I don't mean to put discord down at all because I'm on it every day, Yeah, but, when I first heard about Discord, I thought, oh, that sounds really cool. Servers everywhere of all kinds yeah. of stuff. And I got on there and I was just felt like I was, I felt like I was in uh, basically like a party with no friends. Like I had right. No one right. There was no one and yeah. no way to join in the conversation or anything. Totally. It took me well, forever to get involved in any of it. That, so that's why I say what I think Discord's really good at is point, pointing a like pointing a bunch of people to say something like this is going to happen and then if we all go there it's very almost like formal that's why i'd say like that's like attending a seminar is like discord but i usually don't know anyone and then i'm all like quiet focused like when i go into a seminar room i look around and i go like oh there's some people i'd love to get to know it seems like my people but i'm just going to be quiet and just listen but then it's like that bleed afterwards where everyone's kind of mingling outside of that room afterwards. That's to me clubhouse where it's like, I still don't know anyone, but now I have like kind of an excuse to maybe like listen in for a little bit then just like throw in a comment, maybe a joke, soften it up. And then like a half an hour later, I'm like, this is my best friend that I'm going to play a game with, you know, like that moment I think is like what clubhouse can foster. It's still like you're isolated. It's still like you could just, be creepy in the back, but, and be a wallflower. And that's cool. Sometimes you just want to do that. Sometimes you just want to sneak in and sneak out, but it gives you a chance to just kind of like throw something out there and you have no idea how it might go. Like on Thursday, um, I was in a discussion. No, Friday, Friday, a from brain games had organized a chat that was focused on, all gamers if you're a video gamer or a board gamer let's get together and chit chat and it was hilarious because he arranged i had no idea but the lead designer for candy crush was there lives in sweden i mean one of the most famous hugest games in the world and while we were chatting i mentioned dark knight he would he mentioned kickstarter and i said hey you know shameless plug but if you're if you're buying some kickstarters maybe you want to check this out and then like 10 minutes later he's like hey i'm backer 3107 and I was like, oh, that's so cool. And he's like, yeah, like, thanks for making me lose more money. And I'm like, ah, oh, well, you know, sorry about that. Not lost. <laughs> oh. Right. And, but a conversation started. Like, it was like, even just kind of like, first it was marketing. 
But like as it went on, it was just like an excuse to talk about games and yeah, you know, like he was like mentioning from the video game perspective versus like I would use terms that he didn't know because that was a board gamer term. And he'd be like, Oh, well, in our world, we call that this. And I I felt like at the end of it, it was like, oh, not only did I learn, but I just feel like I've connected with people and and learned about people that in my mind it was like Candy Crush, this giant company making an enormous game and here we're talking about like what's your day like working and designing games versus what's my day like and we're just both trying to grind it out that's interesting and i'll have to see if uh, there's a floating invite out there somewhere oh if you need one let me know i, yeah, I have yeah, a yeah one. oh wow was yeah. it just throwing them around like candy they're just there they are <laughs> they're, they're, like as much as it's exclusive like usually if i run out of one or two then all of a sudden i just ask someone else they you like you find each other cool well it's yeah, nice that you kind of it. vouch for the person you're giving it to right yeah so it's not like anyone can join on there i mean you you want everyone on there but maybe not everyone and the people because it'll say like recommend like when i'm on it shows that i was recommended by daryl so if i do something dumb oh. like daryl's gonna get the why did you bring him kind of thing no oh that's interesting mm -hmm. so how long does that stick i don't like, know like a I'm year a, later i'm afraid responsible i'm afraid what michael might do <laughs> mm -hmm. oh it's coming i just wanted that little party had to go away and now i'm just gonna go full uh, on uh, just... i should definitely get an invite from uh mike then because that way i can really trash his name right and that's <laughs> the accountability structure because then i go to you when he makes me look bad i go well yes. can you make mike look bad right yep <laughs> perfect yeah so get the one from daryl <laughs> No, it is fun, and I, I'm, it was a good segue into what I wanted to talk about is, is what Clubhouse can bring to the, the board game uh, culture, and I, you smashed it. That was awesome. So there is a lot of board game stuff on there already? Well, starting. It's Throwing. kind of bubbling up. It's funny, and, and it's happening fast. Like I want to say the board game option to say like interest just became available like a, a few weeks ago. Because yep. wow. I even remember a few people logging on to me like, oh, I can't believe there's not even board games. And I, I actually, I ref well, I reference you because I laugh even harder because uh, NHL's not on there and they have sports. And I'm like, well, if you think board games are missing, like the entire NHL is missing. Yeah, no <laughs> hockey? Come on. <laughs> so, so like there's huge gaps, but that's fine. They're just, I think they're, like even like the, the the bottleneck of invites, it's that they are trying to, you know, slowly grow and maybe catch enough momentum without just being like a blast for a week and then everyone like forgets it the next day. Um, and so they're like, yeah, if you're interested in that, like then we'll start building that. You'll be on our kind of our hit list of like what next to do. So I think our board game group, we have like probably like two three hundred signed up for it, and we've been. Yeah. up for a week or two that's it's pretty neat it, like chris said it too it, it's it's kind of like the seminar when you're at the convention like yep. there are a lot of so many people that are hosting this chat or in this room talking about this thing and you get the push notification and i'm sitting here working on emails or talking to a partner about you know another yep. game being published and this is just on like it's just i'm listening to daryl talk to someone about anything like it's really it is really well it's funny there was a person the last one we were on a person from india jumped on and yep. started talking about the in, the game scene in india and right. it was fun they were a fan of sagrada and i was like hey have you ever heard of holy holy yep and got to talk about like what's the perception there like yeah. what is it coming is it cost prohibitive is it exciting like to have that theme and that story and yeah and so like that felt really revitalizing and fun to like talk to you know people around the world like about stuff and it's amazing that some of the people that are chiming in like we're five o'clock in the afternoon and they're like it's two in the morning here so i'm gonna right. bounce like wow like they stayed up to listen to whoever was talking about whatever it was for that day and it's anywhere across the i mean yeah it's got to be ios but it is pretty neat yeah oh that's pretty cool um in a uh, normal uh, full 42 fashion. It's an hour and a half in, and we're halfway through our notes. <laughs> this one hour show. I was um, supposed to do this. My bad. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Are you tipping your hat? Yeah. yeah too, too late now. Um, I, well, 
I'm not trying to end it actually. I, if if you you want to end it, we can do no, that. No, no, I was just joking. I'm happy to this episode, but I, I did want to actually push a little bit so that we can get to some yeah. of these other things because there's some cool stuff here to talk about. Yeah, let's um, do it. Uh, speaking of the board game industry, Asmodee is swallowing up uh, game companies is how Mike wrote it on here. That's not how I wrote it to Mike. He he took the negative uh, view of it. I'm, I'm going to take a positive view of it. Whoa, um, whoa, whoa. I know. I know. We're, we're flipping things on its right. Wow. Yeah, I'm being positive this time. Um, specifically, this is about Plan B, right? They, they just got Plan B games. Mm-hmm. So, um, well, they bought, you, two weeks ago they bought Board Game Arena. Was it yeah. two? It was later than that, but yeah, yeah, uh, Board Game about Arena. Like, about like two. Yeah, and so now what? Board Game Arena shut down and miserable. Is that what's going on? Nothing's happened. Nothing's changed. Yeah, <laughs> I, I haven't fun. even. I, I haven't no. been on Board Game Arena, so I don't know if something would have changed. I'm <laughs> curious where that's going to go, but. Well, okay, so I'll tell you why I took the positive. Yeah, let's hear it. It's because in the first, whatever post I saw that on, someone said, oh, no, they're like Disney swallowing up everything. And instantly I thought, that's awesome. Because Disney gave me Solo and Mm -hmm. Rogue One and all this other Star Wars content I would have never had before. Disney gave me Endgame. It gave me all this wonderful WandaVision stuff. I love Disney. Awesome. Yep. And if you're going to associate that with that, then what's Asmodee going to give me with all this other stuff that they're getting? So you could argue that, uh, it, I mean, it really depends on what they do with it, obviously. But um, so far, I mean, the fantasy flight hasn't fallen apart. I mean, they, they have moved... Uh, pieces around, right? They moved X-Wing to some other group or something like that. But I mean, it's still there. You're not, they're not stealing anything from people. They're not, I haven't had any adverse effects of Asmodee taking over things, at least that I am aware of. Um, So I could argue that what's happened is Plan B has opened up all its possibilities to do more with what what it's already got. Right. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of positive potential. I think, obviously, they see it as a, a great acquisition to be able to push out some quality stuff. I I would say, um, personally, I would think it will help or be positive on the big titles. So, like, for instance, I do know, for instance, like, Asmodee has an internal process where they rate all of the games that they own, and the top 100 get intentional strong marketing fortunately if you're game 101 that drop off is significant Mm. and so the positive will be there's some really strong titles that plan b has that will get even better exposure support you know when certain games that you love are ready for their reprints they'll even get a better artist they'll get even you know better production attention and i think a lot of those things will be really positives unfortunately Literally by them acquiring, that means whatever were the games in the 90s in the internal rating and whatever that system was just got pushed. And we might not even know those games or be fans of those games. But the irony is some of those games are huge and uh, because they own so many big games now. <laughs> so that's where I go like, that. that's going to be a little bit of a shame. There's going to be a few games that kind of get lost in that shuffle. Um You know, I remember, like, for an example, um, like, I think it was uh, Bear Park, uh, Phil Hart. Yeah, um, that was an example of a game that I think fell out initially when they were all acquired and such. And that that game was out of print for a while until they could get around to it. Um, It it did, and it's a great game. So, thankfully, but maybe it just was, like, a lower priority. They can only, you know, if you're going to market well, you can't market everything. Um, so I think that's a real factor. I also give super kudos, um, to plan B pulling off amazing shenanigans of like selling a company, Sophie Gravel, the main head owner of plan B, she sold Z-Man initially to Asmodee, sold everything, like made a huge company herself. 
a really impressive Rolodex, sold it to Asmodee, started from scratch again, not fully scratch because she cherry picked a few titles that she kept to build around, but built another one and literally called it Plan B and it worked. Mm -hmm. And then she sold it to the same people again, which is incredible. So, I mean, I'm looking forward to Plan C. And uh, and I I'm curious how much Asmodee is gonna pay for that. Like they should just give her a check and say we'll build something. Mm. Uh, we're we're in already because that is did, impressive. So Ooh. did they also get next move with that plan? Because they did. It was plan. it was all part of that. And ironically, when she originally sold Z Man, she kept next move because at that time that was one of the things she kind of started to build around. But I think this, I, I don't know the details because I haven't talked to Sophie or a couple of the immediate people, but I'm under the impression that she kind of sold everything um, again to Asmode. But um, last, last time, the only reason I knew she kind of had a few titles back was because I knew the people that had the game. So for instance, Emerson's Century was with Z-Man. That was one she carved out and said like, I'm selling the company, but I'm keeping this game. And then was one of her flagship titles that that she built the new company around and obviously it did super well and emerson's a crazy talented uh great designer and they did great marketing doing different versions and and made us all fomo over oh i have the spice version now i need a golem version and i need a special edition oh, i gotta get a gen con and i mean i got suckered in all kinds of ways i got play mats and special cups and you name it so mm -hmm. i did have a bone to pick with the golem edition but we've covered that on another <laughs> yeah no and that's why i just skate over i have i yeah. have bones over it personally but on a business side you know right. i can't way to go make it money. <laughs> yeah. um mike uh what is your take on it I, I i don't know if you have a negative take on it. i just thought it was funny the way you wrote it in there no oh, it just seemed for a while there that asmodee was buying so many things and then like the beast hibernated for a while and now they're starting to come back out and they got board game arena and now plan B. And I'm, I'm just curious. It comes in waves. It feels yeah. like, like there was yeah. like a bunch that got signed and then it got quiet again. I remember I started a game company for like what felt like a week, uh, maple <laughs> games. And everyone asked me, Oh, so you're just going to sell the asthma day though. Right? Like that's just, that's the plan. Like that was the default assumption. And I feel like it must have been like after one of the waves because everyone was just like, yeah, that's what you're doing though, right? You're just building it to sell the asthma there. Yeah. So it's just even like kind of a funny vibe that uh, like sometimes everyone's worried like asthma day is going to buy everyone. And there's almost like an, a rebellion, like the anti asthma day. Yeah. And then it's a little weird to me because I haven't seen any negative repercussions from it. Right. Like I said, I'm still, I'm still, still have an abundance of games that i'm enjoying sure. okay? whether they're from asthma day or from not asthma day yep. there's nothing that is stopping more game companies being made mm -hmm. and they could just swallow up game companies forever i guess because like you said you know someone could sell it all and walk away and make a new one yep. uh, well, it's got to say something good about it right if your company is being sought after and purchased by such a unbelievable group then you must be doing something right sure but like i for a while there there were so many being swallowed up that i kind of lost track of who actually got swallowed up and then forgot about mm -hmm. plaid hat games well plaid i was just gonna ask like if you ask plaid hat i don't know how they might share about how positive that was right they had a unique experience well i don't know if it was unique but as far as i know they had a unique experience um but yeah that would be more they got there was like that. what what, what happened to the company, right? Like Mice and Mystic was great. Tail Feathers was not as great, but still good. And then like, there was just nothing. And I wonder if that was because of what happened. I, this is a speculation. I have no idea, but like right. that was the majority of their titles were titles that I would follow and I enjoyed. And then there was nothing. And I wonder if that would speak to what you just said about why well, I, I never heard of any negative repercussions, but that company kind of, I don't know. Right. I didn't see anything come out of them. Well, and, and now, like, they lost their top titles. Right. And so when they bought the company back, they got, they kind of had to buy it back without having some of their their greatest hits. Like but they kept the hits. crossroads mechanism, right? Like, that whole thing is still theirs? I don't think so. Oh, they lost that too? So is the uh, Forgotten Water, because uh, that has crossroads in it, right? 
Is that yes. uh, Asthma Day plaid hat? I think it's still Asthma Day. Okay. I could be wrong on that and don't quote me on it, but I'm pretty sure the whole uh, system is, is is Asthma Days. Um, somewhere I was wondering if, but and even if it said plaid hat, it would still say. Yeah, right. Would, and then I think the muddy water that multiplies it even more is Isaac now has just uh, started uh, Rose Gauntlet, which is like another like kind of like I think in that shuffle, some people enjoyed the transition and became part of Asthma Day, and clearly some people didn't and decided like to leave and do different things, either restart Plaid Hat or start different companies. And I mean, that happens everywhere. So it's like, I don't know if Asthma's Day is doing anything wrong. I'm just saying there's there's some pros and cons and hopefully a, a good company like them that has so many people reliant on jobs is going to also manage that well. Like, hope, you know, I think someone just told me that they have 1,900 full-time employees. Wow. And that's not talking about every contractor, like, you know, an artist doing a one-off, a designer doing a one-off, you name it. Like, that's a lot of people. So, like, I was just talking to Stefan Burnell, who um, I think technically works for Repos right now, but has worked almost for every brand and every partner in their whole umbrella and was one of, like, the early employees. Like, he, he grew up, he was telling me, basically the head of every different partner is someone that he used to work with and so <laughs> when he goes to paris and goes to the head office or outside of paris somewhere in france like no one knows him when he's like talking to the front desk or or talking to you know whoever is like in a new employee but he knows the prez of like in each division <laughs> so like when he's like hey i need a meeting with so and so and they're like oh i don't know if you can he's like well just ask like <laughs> trust me <laughs> it's like like we're, do, we're we're doing lunch like <laughs> that's pretty good yeah um the yeah i don't know the details of the flat hat stuff so i mean maybe there is something there and you're right you know it, the bigger something gets there are going to be things that fall through the cracks and stuff um i didn't know about the the top 100 thing but it actually makes sense yeah and i don't blame them know, for it yeah and, and you know i've seen it's smart to do that. I've seen mm-hmm. some people uh, do it the opposite way where they're like, oh, these games are failing. Let's put marketing behind right. it. And I've and never you, seen that work well. No, it's usually you're kind of throwing money at bad. So. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I can understand if my game was number 101, I'd be upset, right? Yep. <laughs> sure. And at some point you got to draw lines, right? So. Yeah. If it was a list of 150, there's still a 151. So, also, and I'm I, sure, and I'm sure it's somewhat gradual. But at some point too, you just like you got to really k- try when you're marketing. It's like you can't kind of like half do it. Right. So that's also why I think that you know the steepness of probably 101 is a lot steeper than say 70 to 69. Well, you're yeah. also fighting with what 3,000 games that are being published sure. every year. So I mean. Sure. Not only does your game have to have the right marketing and, and hit hard when it hits, it's got to be like uh, the mechanism's got to be tight. Like the, the feedback behind it's got to be rolling. Like yeah. it's got to be unique in some way. It can't just be a retheme of something. Like it's got to. So then couple that with, man, we've got 400 titles under our belt. Which ones do we really push? Yeah. And, the, and then there's, there's other layers to it that I'm sure really inside baseball factor people. Like for instance, like Asthma Day is a distributor. So there's a lot of game companies that aren't Asthma Day games that access Asthma Day, like they got signed to get their game into France or Germany or wherever. Yeah. And that gets muddy too, because maybe you felt like you're an important client of theirs. And as they buy up more things, obviously they're going to serve their own needs before someone else. And so that also is why that conversation can become complicated I mean, I have a little bit of inside knowledge on that one because I got the experience of working with third-party licensing a bit. Um, and because of that, like you start to kind of, like, that's a real meaningful conversation is kind of like, you know, where are you in the pecking order mm-hmm. and, and how important are you a client to them? And dollars and cents don't lie. So like as much as, you know, they offer these really great end-to-end services, where they have these relationships, they're going to do that for their games more right. than, you know, another client. So, yeah. that so has the oldest child in a family of 10. 
Right. <laughs> it's like we'll get we'll get to you eventually, but you know, you That's maybe they'll they'll help each other. I also have to wonder, like, if you're number one hundred and one or whatever, and you're getting Asmodee's weakest or weaker sure uh, attention. That might still be more attention than yep. Tim, you could have done on themselves, right? Absolutely, it's, just, it's all subjective. Yeah, well, and and they own a lot more than a hundred, so that's where it's like, right? I'd still, I'd still personally be real happy with one hundred and one, but <laughs> it, it might play into effect of like, as a designer, I pitch all games to all kinds of publishers. You know, as as awesome and as huge as Asmo Day is, there's some real major cons to why I might not want to pitch them a game. I mean, for me, like my best uh, selling experience is Sagrada and, and Ben is not a, a huge, Floodgate is not a huge company, but he put his heart and soul and was able to really like nail down his attention on that. And that's where like, people will ask me, like, do you want a game with a small company or a big company? And I say both. Yeah. I mean, there's some real pros and cons. And Ben is someone who's proven to me that small can do great things just as much as big can do great things. Well, that leads into another question, actually. Um, as far as like uh, working with different publishers versus, I assume, uh, like the first game you ever got published, whatever publisher that was, which one was it? Uh, I can't remember the date, but Michael could look over his shoulders, uh, the walled city. Um, I don't remember the date that it was published, but um, you want me to get it? I can look it up. <laughs> I mean, so, I'm sure a Google search could do it, but uh, so your second game, what made you go? I'm going to go a different publisher versus I'm just going to stick to this one publisher that got me. Sure, into sure. I mean, 2014. So, yeah, there you go. Thanks. Um, well, so my my approach is definitely, and especially back then, was to work on. A lot of games build relationships with a bunch of publishers and my goal was to go full-time. So early on, I was not a full-time game designer. Part of what I saw was, well, if I, if I go wide and I build some relationships with a bunch of different publishers, there's a few different things that can happen. One, you know, I'm not self cannibalizing <laughs> myself by like having three titles with a publisher that ends up just caring about one. Um, so that was one factor. Uh, another one was uh, games take a long time and royalties are a trickle effect. So the hope was like, hey, if I can go wide and then a bunch of little royalties can help make this possible, that would be awesome. So um, that was part of my logic. Um, it also created the opportunity to work with a bunch of different people and different people create different games together. So it also meant like what's a good fit for one publisher wasn't necessarily a good fit for another so for instance, like the Walt City I made with Steven Sauer. Um, I love working with Steven, actually. We just recently started brainstorming a new game, some new game ideas, and uh, I, I would love to make some new stuff with him. But for, for instance, he owns some stores. He has a couple of daughters, like his life. We kind of use the analogy, I wanted to go full-time. And for him, game design was like, hey, you know that beater in the driveway that we can tinker every so often? Like, let's look at game design like that. So so that, you know, timing wise, that was different. So then when I started working with different people, then they might have a connection to a different publisher or they might help make a game more a kid's game and that's not a good fit. So my, my technically the Walled City was the first game I signed, but the first game that came out to market was a game called uh, um, Caffeine Rush, which was a card game by r r Games. And it's a two to six player um, real-time battling baristas game where um, they kind of why I even heard about New York Toy Fair was they would always like throw a flyer and try to reach mass market and so I got to see a picture the very first time I saw that game come out was at New York Toy Fair they had a few copies there and I went oh I, I want to go there someday and so that got on my radar but um that game is like a little tiny thing. And, you know, we were hoping maybe even like there could be a Starbucks version. And that was like our angle was like some little mass card game. It kind of plays like pit. And uh, so our hope was like something like that versus the wall city is this like brain burner cruncher game where we were trying to do El Grande in half the time. Mm. 
<laughs> and so it was like, you know, different missions, different goals, different publishers make make more or less sense. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Especially if you are a prolific des designer like yourself. Well, I don't know about prolific, but I just keep throwing things at people and hope. Well, how many games do you have on shelves? I mean, on my shelf a lot because uh, I keep buying my games. No, 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 no. <laughs> um, you know what I mean. <laughs> how many games have you gotten published? <laughs> yeah, no, I'm thankful. I, I, I cannot complain. And, and honestly, there's, there's waves, right? Like I keep reminding myself and talking to other designers where uh, you get a good stretch and then there's some dry periods too. So I, I'll happily uh, be on the top of the wave right now um, and get to make some games. But I, I also know like, you know, it's a blessing. So uh, yeah, I keep just trying to find people to work with and I've, I've found some. So I just try to uh, also make more games with some of the people that I really enjoy working with. I think it's a really important question for people to really like kind of deep dive on who you make games with if, if you do. And, and that there's a major reason why a lot of people self-publish too is because you get creative control and you might avoid some of the nightmares. Um, you know, I, I've had games that have missing pages of rule books that never got published. I've had uh, people change rules just before it went to print because an editor thought they knew better um all kinds of fun moments where you're like oh one of my one of my all-time favorites uh, uh i just uh was triggered because i saw a tower tower of london behind michael uh and this is like a tragic story of uh of steven sowers and and legitimately i think he actually stopped designing for a year or two because of this i laugh because it's like if you don't laugh you cry um but uh the game in there's a bunch of little mistakes and I actually have met the graphic designer since, and he runs like a really great online show. And uh, I met him at Dice Tower and told him all the little mistakes. And he was just like, I'm so embarrassed. So shout out, like, I don't want to say his name specifically, but he, uh, he knows there were some mistakes along the way. We all are growing and learning, but uh, the game board has these different layers where you look at color and you look at number and you look at quadrant. And um, we designed the game. It's the literal map of the Tower of London. And um, stylistically, they decided to tilt it at like maybe like a 32 degree angle, uh, but still keep it at a quad fold. And but turn the quadrant lines with the tilt. So when you refer to a quadrant on the map, they actually mean like this little weirdly tilted thing, but everyone's going to interpret like a quad fold map as each quad. Yeah. And so like, that's an example of like, just it absolutely breaks the game. And that's just one of the mistakes that happened. And, you know, that stuff can happen. So um, is that a publisher I would never work with? No, I would. But it, there was a time and a setting and a moment why that happened. And why that happened was, it was a huge change at that company that year and new people got brought in and they were still figuring things out and they needed to pump some games out real fast. And it just happened that we were those games. And there, there was probably like four or five games, especially that got pumped out to that gamma where it's gamma right now. I remember seeing tower of London at gamma and that was my first chance to see it. And I opened it up and I was like, uh, and, <laughs> and the publisher's was like, yeah, I know. Sorry. Mm. And I was like, what, you know? And they were just kind of like, we had deadlines. Like we hope, you know, maybe one of these will be a hit and yours is probably not going to be hit. And I was like, yeah, no, it's definitely not going to be. <laughs> and so that's also part of the, like rushing a bunch of games out, you know, that, that happened. And I was just happy something was getting out there and I was focusing on the next game or another game. And now I'm more picky about like, if I, I would happily work with the same company, but I would maybe, you know, ask to be more involved and support it. And, you know, they would say, you know, something like I wasn't really involved anyway. So, you know, that's a fair complaint. You know, if you're working on a lot of things, you can't necessarily be as involved and some publishers are better at dev and finishing games. So that that's all part of like navigating. And I, I tell a lot of designers now, 
like if you sign a game with a publisher, maybe ask the last three people, like what was their experience like? Mm -hmm. Like do some homework, ask some questions. Designers are obviously going to look out for other designers and tell you what you know what it what it was like. Don't just like have a sweet dinner with someone or a nice conversation because they said yes. You just assume this marriage is going to go great. Mm -hmm. We don't do that with anything else. So you know, do some research, figure out if if you jive. Yeah, that's smart. Yeah, that's a great positive spin on, um, I guess, you know, I just didn't turn out exactly like I want, but I got another game. I'm just going to jump on that. And that's, yeah. I feel like that's something you have to do as a designer. Right. I mean, there's so many, there's long waiting periods. There's sometimes you get yeah. your game signed and it sits on the shelf for two years. Oh, yeah. That's a specific yeah. thing I'm dealing with right now. <laughs> there's... Well, I Here's a doozy one. Uh, I, I once pitched a game that a year later, they were like, oh, by the way, do you have a rules file? And I handed it, a prototype with rules. I said, why didn't you say something this whole year? And they're like, oh, yeah, like we threw it in our luggage and we lost the rules. And I just thought of it now because I saw you again a year later. Wow. Yeah. So oof, there could be some yeah. long periods. Well, I just advised somebody on uh, Facebook. Um, they and you probably even saw this because there was a lot of responses on it but um uh they said that a uh, publisher just turned down my proposal should i push it like get it like push for it more and stuff and i said no not at all if they're not as excited about that game even if they go sure we'll take it sure take that game and put it on the shelf and yeah. work on the games they're excited about Yep. So just move on to the next one, make another game. Yeah. Or or move on to the next publisher and make another game. You know, yep. just keep yeah. Keep it. Never stop. Yeah. I totally agree. And some of them they'll just go faster than others, and that's okay. Like some games, it's a journey. I just I just had on Facebook reminder pictures come up, and there was a picture of a game that I love uh, that's finally coming out called uh, Mind Management. Mm. And I first played that game four years ago, and that doesn't even count the time that that game was being made. But I just saw a picture of me playtesting it. It wasn't mind management back then. It was a game about powers, another comic book series. And then, you know, the evolution and life of it, I guarantee, like when that game finally comes out, people are gonna be like, wow, there is so many little details and so much work. And it's like, yeah, because they signed it. It was disappointing. It didn't work out. They got it back. They rejigged it a bit. Yeah. Like that was a game that Maple, like that's why I'm biased because I signed it and was going to make it and worked on it a bit and then handed it back and they changed some more things. And that game is awesome now because it had a whole like long development cycle, mm -hmm. <laughs> more than they ever imagined. And it's disappointing when it fell through for them twice. Mm -hmm. But now the game's going to be awesome. Like hopefully it's uh, close to an evergreen or, or at least a, a well-ranked game that sells well. Who knows? nice when is it coming out do you know i think they're uh, literally oh. like manufacturing they showed a video of like the inserts being pumped at the uh gate oh uh, which anyways one of the manufacturers they had a video of the inserts being made that looked really cool all right mike you have what to expect from falcon and oh i thought that's a wandavision i was like wandavision is over wandavision so, um I have seen about half of the trailer from Falcon and Winter Soldier. And I was like, nope, I don't want to know anymore. It looks yep. great. I'm avoiding the trailer. Serious, yeah. dude? Yeah. I just know I'm going to watch them. Like, what right. am I going to do? Yeah, but the of trailers are, no, they hype it up, man. Like, it's mm. so cool. I hate watch. trailers. I hate I trailers. Need don't need it hyped. Only They're time fun. a trailer is necessary is if it's a movie I wouldn't. Or a show that I wouldn't have watched, then it needs to hook me. But otherwise, I don't want to see anything because they're just taking the best scenes or the best moments. Yeah, not Marvel. Marvel doesn't do that. Marvel. Will... Oh, they do it all the time. No, they, they make every it. scene. Just, the just a scene. <laughs> My problem is I can't forget it. So then I'm watching for it. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh well, I know these three characters are in a field together later. So like that person can't yeah. die in this fight. That's impossible. Well, like, how's I remember, that scene? Yeah, I remember Guardians of the Galaxy. 
the whole scene where uh, they're introducing them, you know, where he's doing the whole. Oh yeah, I love thing. that the, scene. The whole trailer scene, yes, is different from what they did. So when I saw the movie, I was like, oh, that wasn't quite as funny as the trailer was. Yeah, like it no, was judging it. And I love yeah. the movie. It's like one of my top favorite Marvels. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, I mean, if it's like I said this about uh, Quentin Tarantino uh, making his eighth movie, I said all you have to do is give me a black screen and say Quentin Tarantino's eighth movie coming back. Yep. It'll be yep. there. I don't care. Yep. So it could be Star Wars. It could be yep. Avenger. I mean, uh, Marvel. Yeah, anything. there's just certain creators and certain yeah. licenses. I don't, yeah. don't want to see it. And, I mean, there's even uh, that in board games, right? I mean, sure, <laughs> sure. Sometimes I see a Kickstarter. I'm like, back, okay, what is this about? Yep. So. But yeah, I don't need trailers for that stuff. I mean, yeah. I understand enjoying it. I see Mike shaking his head there. I, I know that you enjoy watching it. That's cool. I'm sure that's fine, but you don't need it. Don't you want to yeah. be totally surprised? Of course yeah. you don't well, need it. But I went down every rabbit hole with every WandaVision uh, thing that people were thinking of. And then watching the show, you just get a different feeling. Like I'm not... But I the, rabbit, the rabbit holes you did after the episode, no? Like where you chase more things out, or did you watch previews, spoiler stuff? Well, no spoilers, oh. but people's like ideas of well, this could mean this, and this is what this is going to mean, and mm. yeah, I yeah. from all of that. Yeah, yeah. until it's over. Like I, I would be right. all for that now because I'd be like, oh, that's curious. Like that's a funny theory. Mm. Yeah, like there were people mad that Doctor Strange didn't show up. I was like, yeah, hey, well, that was a possibility, right? Sure, but that was all fan theory, and people pissed off about it, or they're pissed off at their own thing. Marvel right. never said that was going to happen. Well, but that's what, that's that, what it, then you avoid that expectation. I would want him. I would have been mad at this point. And, and I and I would argue that that's why uh, like Lost did so poorly at the end because there was such a huge community of people just throwing out all of these ideas of what it could be that those ideas were better than what it ended up being. But if oh, nobody said anything, I disagree. just watched, they would have been okay with it. I actually love Lost Emmy. I'm one of you. I enjoyed Lost a lot, but that's yeah. because I wasn't involved in oh. all of that stuff. And only it was only after I watched it and everyone was like, oh, that was awful. I was like, what are you talking about? Yeah, I like, loved it. No, it could have been this and this. And I was like, yeah. oh, those are all good ideas too. Yeah. Yeah. But they were living those things, like getting on message boards and all that. Agreed. It's the same thing, you know? You it's like can, reading a book before you go watch the movie. Of course, your mind's going to create a better movie. Right. Reading a book, and then you see the movie, you're like, oh, I would have done that better. Right. That's a perfect example, because I do, like, if I can, I, like, I, I'll find out, oh, this book's being turned into a movie. I'll read the book after I see the movie. And right. I'll enjoy the experience, because I'll just read in the characters. Like, I'll already just imagine those in. I will, I don't think I've ever read the book after seeing the movie, but I've oh. seen the movie after reading the books. Sure. And I enjoyed and as it. Did. Oh, you did? Oh. oh, the other way around. Interesting. I'm saying the other way. I, yeah. I actually enjoy the books that I already read. There was always, with the exception of maybe like Lord of the Rings, almost any book that I had read before, I was a little disappointed by the movie. Like I'd always just feel like, oh, but they didn't capture this part or See, like they I skipped expect- this. And- yep. I, I expect that there's no way that like I could go, oh, there's no way they're going to do that little bit and that part with all this stuff and all. Right. And- and I also have a weird thing where it's both good and bad, where for whatever reason, things I read by a year later, I've forgotten. Uh, that's I don't know what a it gift. is. A movie, <laughs> I'll remember that thing for decades. Right. But a book, I've, I've been rereading my favorite two books right now. Well, not nice. Like, well, yeah, some of my favorites. But I keep going back to like the name of the wind, Patrick Rothfuss. Mm. I keep going back and reading those books, and it's almost like totally experiencing it again for me. Almost yeah, my wife, my wife Tanya, she'll forget a movie even a couple years later. I know you said you wouldn't forget, I wouldn't forget a movie, but she'll forget a movie easily a couple years later. So she gets to rewatch some of her favorite things, and I'll be like. I was with you. You gasped that that same thing last time. You right. cried at that same thing, but I'm. It's so fun to watch you like get to enjoy this again. Right. Like, I want. People, I want that. And it's just like, uh, mm-hmm. no. Yeah. I've met people that have that reverse thing with movies and stuff sure. too. So, um, yeah, I kind of wish I had that too, just because of, you know. Oh. 
just to revisit the MCU or Star Wars. Right? Star Wars, especially. Like, I just think, like, I would, even the later ones, and people have strong opinions, yes or no. For me, every time I watch a Star Wars, I'm like a giddy kid. Uh, just like my my heart sings. Like, I'm just like in that first run, and I'm like, oh, brand new Star Wars material that I've never seen. I'm on the edge of my seat. I'm in. I'd, they almost can't do right wrong because I'm just going to like it. I'll have opinions, but I'll just enjoy it. But then I'm like, oh, I wish I could watch it again now. Like, I wish I wish I could have that moment. Like, the minute I see it once, I'm like, okay. It's like fun. when I saw episode one for the first time in the theaters, day one, first showing, and the whole crowd just went nuts. When yeah. Yeah. Uh, That's what you feel every time, right? Every oh, yeah. time when you hear that yeah. music hit, every time. So good. And the logo yeah. hits. Uh, just... Yeah. Okay. Every time. So I'm watching through uh, Clone Wars, and mm. um, I was just watching it before we came on. And every time I hear R2, when he does his little scream when he's in trouble mm-hmm. or he gets hit, kick, yeah. I it just I giggle. I every yeah. time it doesn't matter. Yeah. I love him. Yeah. It'll never. Where are you away. in Clone Wars? no spoilers for people who haven't seen it but oh yeah um we just came off probably one of the worst chunk of episodes i've ever seen ever oh no the jar jar one on rodia no jar jar we talked about jar Jar. daryl have you watched the clone wars uh yes but it's ironically foggy i just started re-watching again and then every time i like as i've been re-watching i'm like oh yeah yeah Oh, yeah, yeah. So I've actually been finding I'm like skipping ahead, being like, what is Foggy? And I, I, I do, just don't know if they're, it was just not as memorable to me. I do have to ask if you're watching in the yeah. chronological order or are you watching it in the order that Disney has it laid out? Disney layout. Yeah, don't do that. Dude. Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's my first run through. Oh. Thanks to Chris, I'm watching it in the way you're supposed to be watching it, which well, makes, that's good. That's makes it good. better. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened was the network was getting the episodes in different ways, whichever way they would the studio spit them yep. out, and they yep. were just putting them out there, so they don't make any sense at all. Yeah, so they're really if chunky. If you look up on the website, they'll tell you watch three hundred one first, then one hundred one. Ah, okay. It, like you bounce around, but then it sure. just smoothly makes a ah, great. Maybe I'll do that. Yeah, totally recommend yeah. doing that. Okay. Yeah, when you get to season four, you can probably skip over like the first half yeah. of season four because man, they suck. Yeah, oh, I, I don't. Yeah, I'll have to talk to you off of here and try to find out why you think so because I don't want to spoil anything for anybody. But yeah, well, well, the after show we can talk about it on the yeah. after show too. But yeah, there's there's I like the little like the three episodes that kind of link in or the four episodes that link in and to be continued kind of stuff. But man, this this last run was rough. <laughs> and you haven't got so you're in the fourth season. Yeah. Okay. You're about to get to okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm jealous. I'm jealous of not getting I love it. I love it. I mean Filoni's a genius. The the, yeah. the cinematography in this this show is just some of the angles when the ships are going. I love that you're nine times out of ten you're looking at the back of people or a yes. back of a ship when the episode yeah. ends. Like that's yeah. really cool. And yeah. the continuity between it. Like it's really yeah, they did a really good right. job of keeping the feel, the film, the uh, yeah. cinematic feel of it and a lot of that. And even in the space battles and stuff, it looks almost movie quality. Yeah, yeah. that that is like so impressive. Yeah. yeah. Just don't light a lightsaber underwater, man. I don't get it. I don't want to see it ever <laughs> I again. Took, I, oh, is that what you have a problem with? That whole no, 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 I'm past water. that. No, I have a problem with it, but I'm past that. I told you there's... There's other problems. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. There, there are references in the old RPGs from the 80s and sure. 90s that say that you can buy part or not buy parts, but Jedi have parts that they can adapt their lightsabers to work underwater. They're plasma based. Plasma works underwater. Yeah, that's not canon I, to me. I believe it. Yeah, that's if it's from the 80s and it's legend. But is it canon because it's in the Clone Wars? Yeah, George Lucas said anything that's on film or in series is canon. Yeah, but George Lucas doesn't decide my canon. He just decides his canon. <laughs> That's fair. That's, good. That's, That's fair. That. You, you get the craft your experience. <laughs> player choice. Player choice. All right. Well, uh, let's see. Well, we've got it about two hours and 15 minutes. Should we wrap it up here and move to Discord just to chat a little bit? Yeah, we can.
Have we talked about did, uh, did something up? Everything? No, no. I, I'm good with what, what we talked about. I mean, we could talk forever, as yeah. people know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this won't be our longest episode. We can make it our longest episode. We could, probably. But uh, let's go ahead and then uh, uh, finish it up here. Uh, thank you, Daryl, for sharing. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, this was fun. Uh, being our first guest. Yeah, first of hopefully many. So, yeah. so if you go back to our first episode, um, my little geeky tiki. Yeah. Do you know what it was? Uh... What would it be? Chris, you might know. Don't say anything. Daryl, what Bat- would it be? No, Batman? No. no. I know. Oh, I you're watched our, it. You're our first guest. Yeah. So what, what was your first TV? Bosk? Yep. Ah, nice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. I just remember. I got her. <laughs> got Bosk right there. Let me remember. Love it. Yeah. Love yeah. it. Yeah, it's been awesome. I, I, I love you. You're awesome. Thanks for taking the time. Um, Pleasure. It was great. Yeah. Great to yeah. Meet you. Yeah, so, our first time actually meeting. So, yeah, and thanks for the cartoon bat version of me. I've gotten lots of compliments about it. <laughs> I'm glad you liked it. Uh, you never know uh, what you what kind of response you'll get when you start making cartoon. That's going to be either the uh, the pool if I start doing that for other guests. If we yeah, other guests. that's fun. Uh, or it's going to be people going, "No, I'm not coming on your show." <laughs> so. And then you make a really bad cartoon of them. Yes. Okay. This is a person that didn't show up this episode. <laughs> they knows and all that. It's going to be good. All right. Well, uh, thanks for watching, everybody. We still got people in the chat. Thanks for staying in chat. That was awesome. And uh, uh, we're going to run over to Discard and uh, Discard. Discard. Discord into the, is it still called the Bat Cave? Yeah, the it Bat still Cave. called the Bat Cave. And talk a little bit. All right. Thank you. Cool. See ya. This is where I end it. Okay, I gotta hit the little button. I can end the meeting perfectly. I can't get the meeting started right. right.